Thank you ever so much. I'm uh, delighted to be uh, to have this opportunity to talk to you about a very important uh, subject that is one of the, my major uh, research uh, areas. Uh, first of all, I'd like to ask to, to say thank you for the invitation and the opportunity. Uh, it's a great uh, uh, honor to be uh, addressing you on uh, on this in this conference, and it's a fantastic initiative. Also, congratulations, and I hope there will be more initiatives like that in the future. Uh, what I will be uh, focusing on in this uh, in this talk is, uh, as Alexandro said, uh, I will talk a bit about basic income uh, policies from a, a geographical perspective. Uh, I'll be drawing on uh, research I have been uh, conducting at the universities of Sheffield and more recently the University of the Aegean. Uh, and uh, the, my main research interests are focusing on uh, social and special inequalities, happiness and well-being, and social justice and basic income uh, as a potential policy for to address social and special inequalities and increase happiness and well-being. So, my talk today is going to be putting forward an argument for uh, basic, basic income from a happiness and well-being perspective and a social science perspective, arguing that uh, in addition to the many uh, advantages that basic income uh, has as a, as, a, as a social policy, uh, including uh, the very low uh, administrative cost compared to uh, the means-tested social policy schemes, and also there's no stigma attached, everybody is entitled to basic income. There's also a very strong case to be made with regards to human happiness and uh, well-being. So, um, just before I continue, I'd like to uh, draw your attention to a number of uh, publications that are relevant to my talk. And uh, here's a list. And in particular, the ones that I highlight here in red, are probably most relevant to what I'm going to be talking about in the next uh, uh, 20 minutes or so. Uh, the first one, what makes a happy city? It's a very, it's a, uh, all, I have to say all, all three of those, the, the red ones, they, you don't need that open uh, access uh, at the moment. So you, you don't need to have uh, access to a library. You can find the uh, free versions of them. Uh, so what makes a happy city? The first one uh, includes uh, a discussion of a lot of these. So I'm going to discuss uh, today, uh, including towards the end, some references to basic income and uh, the work of uh, Philippe Van Paris. Uh, and, but all these papers here really uh, include discussions of income inequalities and basic income in, a, in an implicit way. It's not, even, though it's, even if it's not explicitly mentioned, basic income is a, a major uh, uh, policy that could be used to address uh, in, in, at the impact of uh, inequality upon uh, well-being. So, uh, also, the last one, the last uh, uh, publication is the most my, my most, most recent work uh, drawing on an effort to uh, look at uh, the social geography of Europe, and it includes a lot of maps and human cartograms of uh, inequalities uh, in uh, in Europe. Uh, there will also be a book coming up uh, next uh, uh, in the spring, March or, or April, in relation to that. And again, you can find some. I will show you some maps towards the end of my. Uh, talk today, but I think also this is very relevant with regards to where uh, basic income would make most of an impact. So there are some of the maps are about social exclusion and uh, poverty. So uh, a few more words about the outline of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, as I said, uh, one of my major uh, research areas is the uh, analysis of happiness from an economics and geography point of view. And uh, uh, in this context, I'm trying to also um, link the debates around happiness to inequality, uh, social context, and basic income. So I will give you a, an introduction of what where I'm coming from with regards to happiness, what is happiness, how it can be measured, and uh, a lot of what I'm, I've been trying to do over the past uh, few years is to build models of uh, uh, happiness and well-being and link them to socioeconomic variables and geographical variables, and also linking all this with uh, wider debates and methodolo methodological in innovations uh, that involve uh, the simulation of social policy. So towards the end of my talk, I will uh, give you some examples of uh, a previous work on the analysis of basic income and local policy implications. And hopefully you can see the links between that and human happiness and, uh, and well-being. 
and uh, this is ongoing work. So there will be some outputs there, uh, model outputs, but it is, I have to say, this work is still at its infancy. So I have uh, this more to come uh, in the near future, I hope. So uh, first of all, I'd like to start by uh, defining happiness and well-being and uh, how it can be measured. This is, as you may know, it's a major topic in uh, uh, the social sciences. It's quite trendy. Uh, it has been very trendy in economics and more recently in geography uh, as well. Uh, but I like to say when when I give uh, when I talk about these things to uh, also highlight the origin of the debates. Uh, it goes a long time back, even though it is a very trendy topic in uh, uh, in the social sciences. There are uh, there have been very profound debates, and there is a very strong philosophical tradition. So you could say that perhaps the first signs of happiness uh, research go back to ancient Chinese uh, philosophies. Uh, Buddhist philosophers, and uh, then you could argue that uh, the origins of Western thought in uh, this field uh, are uh, go back to the uh, to Greece, and a few decades after the Buddhist philosophers uh, uh, formulated their ideas, we have uh, uh, the first uh, debates over uh, in, uh, in in Greece uh, by Socrates, Plato, and perhaps the first uh, one of the first examples of thorough treatment of uh, what happiness is. And uh, these thoughts and ideas also relate to what I'm going to be talking about with regards to inequality. Uh, uh, go back to the uh, work of Aristotle. Uh, and uh, then uh, there has been, uh, you could argue, a paucity of uh, uh, work in this field of on happiness and, and well-being uh, for some time until uh, 18th century in uh, England, uh, when we have the ideas of Jeremy Metham and uh, John Stuart Mill. Uh, when uh, we uh, have uh, uh, the foundations of modern uh, uh, happiness research in, in some ways, uh, the def definition of utility, the principle of utility and the idea that any human action, including policy, public policy, should be aimed at uh, maximizing human happiness. So what I will be arguing in the next few minutes is that this basic income is one of these policies. If we uh, develop and apply, implement basic income uh, policies, there is a uh, this is uh, it is extremely likely to also increase uh, happiness overall, social well-being and uh, human well-being at all uh, levels. And I will give you, I will uh, develop uh, the argument to that end, and also give you some examples, uh, including some empirical examples. So, um, as I have been, uh, I briefly said earlier, there is a, uh, has been a lot of. Uh, debates and this topic of happiness and well-being has become uh, increasingly trendy in the social sciences, especially in economics. And in more, more recently, there have been a lot of attempts to actually measure happiness, so measure how happy people are uh, and uh, try and link that to social policy uh, and a wide range of other factors. And one of the things that uh, links back to uh, the philosophical uh, debates that I mentioned is that uh, you could argue that th th there are philosophical uh, traditions according to which happiness and well-being is something that can be achieved uh, in abstraction of uh, uh, society. So you could, could perhaps argue uh, that uh, according to uh, some of the Buddhist uh, traditions, the Chinese philosophies, you could achieve a state of nirvana and happiness regardless of what's going on around you. Whereas uh, in uh, the context of uh, Aristotle's framework, uh, this Aristotle would probably disagree with that and as uh, has been pointed out uh, in the quote that uh, you can see here, hopefully, uh, is uh, he argued that you cannot answer the question of happiness and well-being in abstraction of uh, society. So you could argue that social context matters according to this uh, uh, approach and uh, inequalities, social and special inequalities, inequalities in income and wealth also uh, matter. I will come to that in a moment. So there is a lot of uh, profound debates and a lot of traditions that we can base on our uh, uh, ideas and build build on that and i will be arguing that basic income is amongst the policies that can be uh, used to engage with the debate about social context make sure that uh, no one is left behind there's uh, levels of inequality are very low there's social cohesion uh, and uh, all these things are extremely relevant to uh, uh, happiness and well-being and uh, there has been a lot of debates about the idea of actually measuring uh, happiness and well-being uh, a lot of skepticism, but over the past few years, there has been very strong arguments 
suggesting that we can actually measure happiness using social surveys and these measures of happiness are quite valid. I don't have time to uh, make to convince you if, if there are any skeptics amongst the audience. I, can't, I don't have time to, to go through all these uh, uh, debates and evidence in, in the context of this talk, but there is a lot of uh, the evidence reviewed in the papers I mentioned in the beginning. So I would like to suggest that you may wish to uh, refer to this, the what makes a happy city paper, for example, has a, a, an overview of, of these studies, arguing that it is possible to measure happiness and uh, it is a valid measure. I will give you some examples uh, before I go on to the basic income uh, uh, to, uh, examples. I, will give you, I would like to give you some uh, examples of uh, how it can be measured. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, efforts to put some theoretical background to all of this, including the work of Amartya Sen, uh, suggesting that we can measure happiness, but even it is quite complex and uh, uh, tricky to measure. We can do it, I will show you some examples, but we should also bear in mind uh, issues such as the uh, marginal uh, utility of, of happiness, and this again links to basic income. So with regards to this quote by uh, Amartya Sen, uh, renowned economist and uh, uh, holder of the Nobel Prize, uh, you you could argue that we need to take into account of uh, circumstances of different people. So to give you a simple example, if we um, give 10 euros to um, a homeless person in Athens, uh, they their happiness level will uh, go up by quite a lot uh, for even momentarily. Okay. Uh, if we give 10, 10 euros to uh, Bill Gates or uh, one of the wealthiest people in, in, in Greece, their happiness will go will, will not go up at all, or they may be even they may even go down. They may be offended that you, you, you give them this kind of amount. So I will be arguing later on that this links to the basic income uh, debates. You could say that by providing a basic income, most of the people who would benefit would be people in the lower end, the lower end of the income distribution. So they will be their happiness will go up by quite a bit if they have a. a and an, an amount, a guarantee that there is a, some money. Everybody gets it, but the people in the lower end and most people uh, would be happier as a result. So uh, there is a very th strong theoretical argument uh, forward, and uh, there's also increasingly a lot of empirical uh, evidence. And uh, I'm working on both fields more, more lately on the empirical evidence, and I'll uh, discuss this uh, later on. And also amongst the people, key people who have been uh, providing the evidence, uh, is uh, uh, one of the leading uh, social scientists, is economist Andrew Oswald at the University of Warwick, and colleagues who have also done an very extremely impressive amount of work on, the, on this field, building uh, statistical models of happiness and well-being. Also, you might be interested in uh, the, in the Netherlands, is uh, Professor Ruth Winhoven uh, at uh, Erasmus University in uh, uh, Rotterdam. He has developed a well database of happiness, which I think is anyone can access it if, if people send an email to his team uh, they're happy to provide it uh, as long as they know what it is used for. So uh, I'd like to give you some examples of how it is measured. So uh, amongst the data sets that I uh, have been uh, using, the British Household Panel Survey includes a set of questions that relate well-being and happiness, subjective well-being and happiness. Uh, so these questions include, have you been able to concentrate on whatever you have been doing uh, you, uh, recently, have you been losing much sleep over worry, feeling that you are playing a useful part in things, feeling capable of making decisions about things, feeling constantly under strain, feeling you could not overcome your difficulties, being able to enjoy your normal day-to-day -day activities, being able to face up to your problems, feeling unhappy or depressed, uh, losing confidence in yourself and having been feel, feeling, thinking of yourself as a worthless person and the so-called general happiness question, have you been feeling reasonably happy, all things considered. So this is a, an example of how happiness and well-being, subjectively, subjective happiness and well-being is measured in social surveys. Uh, you could use the last, the response to the last question for a general happiness measure, or it is also quite common to use a score that combines the response to all that. So we have a uh, a score of subjective well-being and happiness. Other measures, more simple, uh, are asking people uh, how satisfied they are with their life from zero to ten. Um, normally, I ask the audience about that, uh, I, and there is some interaction. I can't see you right now, but I'd like to ask you to think uh, how you would put the uh, 
your happiness score if if I were to ask you that question right now. Um, and I'd like to point out that the average for Europe is about uh, somewhere between six and seven. So if, if you are six or seven, uh, you are average. Uh, perhaps me talking for 10 minutes reduces your happiness a bit. I don't know. Depends. Uh, or it goes up a bit. It's uh, uh, the Greece, I think, and is, is slightly below or perhaps more recently quite a bit below this average. So just these are just examples of how you can measure happiness and how this can be linked to uh, other things. Some more examples before I move on to social policy uh, of examples of happiness analysis and uh, what matters in life and what, what, what people do and who do they interact with. Uh, this is by uh, drawing on uh, evidence from uh, a University of Texas study discussed in a book by Richard Laird on happiness. Uh, Richard Laird, an economist at the London School of Economics. Um, so as you see here, we have some uh, uh, a, a summary of uh, uh, activities and how they contribute to happiness on top of the activities uh, is uh, having sex, followed by socializing after work, dinner, and in the bottom of the list is uh, uh, morning commute, uh, working, evening commute, childcare. I like to use these graphs also to try, try and convince uh, skeptics that this, this is not something that can be measured. You could argue that these uh, uh, results, and there are many hundreds or thousands of studies like that, uh, suggest that subjective uh, measurements of happiness using social survey look quite plausible. Also, in the same study, there was a question on whether uh, interacting with people, who you interact with, and how this affects your happiness scorings. Uh, we see here on top of the list is interacting with friends, followed by parents and relatives, uh, your spouse. And then on the bottom of the list is uh, interacting with your boss. So more, most people would rather be alone ra ra rather than interact uh, with uh, their boss. So I would say this is uh, uh, this evidence suggests that it is it, it makes sense to measure happiness, and you can link it with a wide range of other things. And there have been lots of uh, studies measuring a number of things. Uh, I have a summary here of uh, categories that can be linked to happiness and well-being. So for example, age, demography. Uh, People in most studies are reported to be very happy in the, when they're teenagers, and then it, happiness levels go down, and by the time they are in their late 30s, 40, it reaches bottom, rock bottom. And then the good news is that it goes up again by the time you are in your late 60s, uh, 70s, it's at the same levels as when you were a teenager. And there are many other uh, studies uh, looking at all these uh, factors I list here, and uh, there is consensus that you should include this in statistical models measuring happiness and well-being. And just to go back to the uh, basic income uh, <clears throat> policy, uh, the relevant bit here is that we have all these uh, debates around what makes a good life and what is happiness. Uh, as I also mentioned earlier, uh, if we go back to Aristotle, we could argue that it's not just what we have as individuals. It's not just income. All these things are important. Uh, income, relationships are extremely important, employment status. But it is also income distribution and where we are in society, our standing in society, self-esteem. So there has long been argued from a theoretical perspective that uh, it is very important. Context, social context, social comparisons are extremely important. Uh, going back to Aristotle, uh, also more recently, uh, we can look at uh, the work of uh, Karl Marx, who argued that a house may be large or small, the, the, the size of the house we have uh, is important uh, for, but it is also very important to the, the social context. So a house can be large or small, but it, it could be large enough to satisfy our uh, needs uh, uh, for, for, a, for a dwelling. But if people around us or people in the same city or in the same country have a, a much larger uh, house, then it affects our, our happiness and, and, and well-being. So it's uh, if we think about that in terms of basic income, we can uh, look at not just the house, anything. Basic income makes inequality lower and makes it ma makes well-being overall higher. And uh, just to also point out, uh, similar thoughts have been expressed by Adam Smith, uh, not just Karl Marx, uh, about the social context and what we have is important. But it is also what is also extremely important is uh, the social context, what we have in relation to others. Uh, and uh, income and well. I just want to point out you have uh, four minutes left. Uh, okay. I want to like remind you. Okay. Okay. So thank you. Thank you for that. I uh, 
So this is a number of research questions with regards to uh, happiness and well-being. So what I'm, what I'm going to is spatial scale and social comparisons are extremely important. Uh, we need to look at comparisons and income inequality. There's also extremely uh, a, a very impressive amount of evidence about uh, health and social problems, and including happiness and well-being and inequality. Richard Wilson and Kate Pickett uh, have provided an uh, amazing amount of evidence, uh, putting proof up around all these debates I mentioned. And uh, my own work, I'm what I'm trying to do is to build models of uh, s simulation models. I don't know if you're familiar with the game Sim City and the Sims. Uh, what I'm trying, I've been trying to do is to build something similar uh, for with real data and explore models of happiness and well-being and also public policy analysis and uh, including basic income uh, policies. So uh, amongst these uh, uh, examples of this work, uh, and as I said earlier, it is at its infancy, uh, but I did experiment with uh, ideas of simulating what would happen in Britain, and in particular, I have an example here of the city of York, what would happen if uh, we um, implement this, a basic income policy and other social policies, how, what would be the local implications of that? So he, here we have a, a, an index of poverty in York, what, how many households are below the half of the average income in uh, the city of York in England, uh, according to a simulation model. And uh, what I have been trying to do is to experiment with policy scenarios, looking at what would happen if we give everybody basic income, different scenarios, so that a scenario, an extreme scenario is taking, would involve taking everybody's income uh, and away, so 100 ta income tax and then giving this back equal to equally to everybody else, so everybody has the same income. There are different possibilities you can look at with regards to taxation, uh, and and basic income can be uh, they can be it can be funded through a number of uh, initiatives. Uh, what I have been trying to do is to look at the implications of that locally so uh, this map shows you if we were to uh, implement basic income according to scenario three uh, we would have a massive reduction of households in poverty so a lot of households would be lifted out of poverty and also locally an argument that could be uh, put forward is that these people people who are in the lower end of the income distribution in addition to increasing happiness overall uh, we have from a, a fiscal stimulus point of view, people who are in the lower end of the income distribution are more likely to spend their income locally. And this would have multiplier effects. So if you give uh, 50 euros, 100 euros, 500 euros to a poor person, they are very likely to spend it at the local uh, grocery, the local supermarket. If you give it to a very uh, wealthy person, they are more likely to spend it, to save it or spend it to uh, some luxury item, perhaps. So there are arguments there for fiscal stimulus uh, related arguments and uh, very briefly I'd like to point out there is evidence and uh, a lot of quantitative uh, analysis and data uh, with regards to all these things and uh, as I said this is ongoing work linking all this to happiness and well-being uh, this is more recent work very briefly earlier uh, looking at European uh, level uh, uh, happiness and also uh, poverty and uh, the impact of austerity across Europe and uh, you could argue that by implementing basic income policies, you could address uh, issues of subjective happiness and well-being, as well as uh, fiscal stimulus, what, which is massively needed, especially in areas in Europe where uh, there has been a massive decline in uh, standards of living and a massive increase of unemployment, as this map illustrates here. This is a human cartogram, so areas are resized according to how many people live within them. So you can see the urban areas being more prominent and then they are shaded, colored by a variable of interest. And we have here the increase of unemployment uh, by region in uh, across European regions. Uh, another map here is the people living in poverty, at risk of poverty across Europe. Uh, and you could argue that by implementing a basic income, the people in this map, the areas that are shaded uh, uh, darkest blue, would uh, massively benefit from that, both in terms of uh, subjective well-being and happiness, but also as a fiscal stimulus, uh, and uh, also uh, with regards to, very briefly, I'd like to point out some of the evidence with regards to happiness and well-being mm -hmm. and austerity, the impact of austerity. This is happiness in across Greek regions. So you can see from 2002 to 2010, uh, this is a, a collaborative work with colleagues at the University of Macedonia, ongoing work. Uh, we looked, we are looking at the impact of austerity and poverty on happiness and basic income could be a way to address that, but you can see the massive drop from 2008 onwards. And this is all 
uh, just a flavor of ongoing work. Uh, my immediate priorities, I'm aware I'm, I've run out of time now, just uh, I need another 30 seconds to discuss this slide, if that's all right. Uh, the ongoing work involves taking this thing further, look at, looking at uh, basic income uh, policies, in, implementing uh, simulation models, and uh, looking at uh, so-called income substitution effects, looking at how what would be, how would people react uh, under different uh, scenarios if they had a basic income? Would they, as Alexandros briefly discussed earlier, would they give up working completely? Would they do something else? Uh, how would that affect uh, the labor market? And what would happen uh, dynamically? So there are increasingly powerful models that we can use to perform what-if analysis. What would happen under different scenarios? Uh, tomorrow, in a month, in uh, a year, and uh, explore all these issues uh, experimentally and argue the case for basic income uh, with evidence to back it. So uh, I would like to thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I very much look forward to, to ask, answering any questions if you have uh, about this or any other aspects. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dimitris. I want to point out whoever has a question, can they please uh, rise up and just come here so they can actually uh, ask the question on the microphone. Uh, if you have a specific question with respect to like uh, how uh, basic income policies perhaps uh, affect uh, Greece or what you've heard already, uh, you can uh, come. You can come this side. Let me uh, change this a bit. Uh, okay. Give me one second. Uh, you, do, does anyone have a question? Yes. Give me one second. Uh, can you hear? Can you just rise and? Uh, yeah, we have a question. Give me one second. Uh, okay. Can you see me? Uh, I don't. I'm not sure if you can see me. Uh, if you if you change your your screen. Uh, so you, I just stop setting to to. To go back. I, I, I can I can stop sharing your screen. Uh, okay. Uh, <coughs> so yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, How do you go? Uh, yes. Okay. So there is a very strong cultural element in the way people talk about their personal life and evaluate their life. So when comparing happiness between several countries, how do you deal with uh, quantifying what is a cultural way of uh, answering to a uh, to questions thank you yeah that's a that's a very good question uh, excellent and, and it's very yes yeah, one of the key challenges here and in relation to that i think in the literature uh, there is an example of uh, uh, the french and the americans it is argued that the french people for example are less likely to say they're happy in a survey compared to the americans and uh, reportedly i think sarah the girl was asked by a journalist if you were happy he said what do you think i am an idiot uh, so there are th th these issues are very important uh, it is very, uh, I would say, there has been some work into trying to control for these things in statistical models, but uh, nothing really conclusive yet. Uh, but there should be this caveat when we compare uh, countries and uh, looking at uh, potential cultural issues uh, when comparing the countries. Uh, so, for example, a lot of the work I've done also involves uh, Japanese data. The Japanese are also thought to be less likely to say they are uh, happy. Uh, so, uh, perhaps one, in, in order to be on the safe side, when uh, uh, analysis like, like that are carried out, it's probably best to stick to uh, comparing uh, regions within uh, the same country or within the same wider regions of Europe, for example, Southern Europe versus Northern Europe. Uh, there are attempts to control for uh, potential cultural bias or even linguistic bias. Linguistic is another one. Uh, for example, in Greek, uh, the word happiness, eftihia, you don't really say it on a day-to-day -day basis. If, if you ask someone if they, they are happy in Greek, they, in using literally this word, is, they are less likely to ask, answer it compared to, uh, to say yes, compared to a British person. When in English, you say it every, on a day-to-day. -day. So there are a lot of issues. I don't think I have a perfect answer for that, but we need to, to control uh, and uh, see if, if there are potential cultural issues by the, using the evidence we have so far. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wants to uh, ask a question? Uh, if, you, if you do, you should uh, come over here. Uh, if not, uh, we will uh, have to um, uh, thank uh, Dimitris uh, Balas for... Uh, ah, you have a question? Can you please... Uh, 
Dimitri, you have one, one last yeah, question? Yeah, of course. I'm, I'm very happy to. Because uh, then we have Shasha uh, okay. uh, preparing. Give me one second. Uh, you can just uh, speak. Uh, you. See him. Normal. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm interested in the way that um, Aristotle and Mill are being applied because um, you're talking about Aristotle and the social context. But the other side of that being that Aristotle's idea of happiness, happiness is virtue, which of is a, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And Mill's idea of happiness, if I remember correctly, is um, ex being free to explore one's conscience. Um, whereas even you know the, even that Anglo recent Anglo uh, Anglophone uh, <clears throat> uh, philosophy is now very different in in yeah. our rampaging self-interested. And self-indulgence form of happiness. So I'm just interested how you're applying this. Uh, thank you. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the, the, there are many uh, potential measures of happiness, and I didn't have time to to look at that. There are including uh, self-fulfillment measures, uh, uh, measurements that uh, look at whether you fulfill your potential in life, linking also to the capabilities uh, literature and Ma Amartya Sen, which also in some way linked to Aristotle, uh, and having mo more uh, more sophisticated. Uh, uh, concept concept of, of, of happiness so there are uh, potential measurements that uh, are using all these things looking at where people are in life and whether they fulfill their potential virtue and all that this way it's quite depending on what you do it's, it could be quite hard to quantify there are phd thesis who are just on that how do you do uh, define happiness according to different uh, approaches but i would say that with regards to basic income uh, and uh, social policy i would imagine and again these things are this is ongoing work very exciting work in the social sciences, but I would imagine that regardless of which definition you have, basic income and income inequality are going to be very important. Um, so there are there are possibilities to do what you say. Uh, also, another possibility is to, con from the point of view of self-interest, it's quite this is quite an interesting one because you could argue that everybody's pursuing the self-interest to make, become happy, but people are also altruistic. They they would jump into the sea to save someone. You could say that by doing that, they are also perhaps selfish because they are happy by doing that. So the, mm. the, the border between being uh, selfish and uh, altruistic, perhaps, I mean, from a philosophical point of view, can be explored uh, further. But Although Aristotle would put altruism below virtue. Yeah, there you go. I mean, <laughs> and a third, self-indulgence. <laughs> OK, but that's great. Thank, yeah, you. thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So we're actually uh, right on time. Uh, we finished the questions. I want to thank you once more for um, uh, participating and answering our questions uh, and for your presentation, of course. Um, so thank you once again. Thank I'm now going to switch uh, over to uh, Shasha and uh, and put you on mute. Give me one, one second. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Sasha, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. So um, I'm going to basically put you right there. So first of all, I want to mention uh, that uh, uh, Sasha did us a, a big favor in actually uh, uh, speaking today because uh, he, um, he just informed me like, uh, recently that he, he's a bit uh, sick at the moment. So uh, I want to thank him once again for actually making the extra effort to speak to us from, uh, from Germany. So thank you uh, a lot, Sasha, for this. Um, as you can see, the audience is waiting for you, so I'm not going to basically uh, uh, delay any, any longer. So just take it away. Okay. Thank you, Alexandros, for uh, inviting me for that uh, now uh, brief talk about uh, the connection of uh, basic income and democracy. When you uh, deal with basic in income today, um, there are some very elementary um, objections you encounter. Uh, one is, for example, as my title says, that it's uh, UBI that would be a utopia. People, before introducing it, have to learn to cope with freedom and uh, self-determination. They're not prepared for what basic, in basic income needs as a presupposition. That's quite a strong objection. And the other one that comes with it, uh, it's like uh, the brother in mind or sister in mind of that objection is that people tend to be lazy, they need incentives, without incentives, uh, you know, the social world and social cohesion, cohesion goes down, 
Tezo is t torn apart and so on. Um, being a sociologist, uh, I'm interested in uh, looking at how people are already living, not uh, in a utopian sense, uh, in an everyday life practice sense. And um, when you uh, uh, approach the idea of the basic income from this point of view, then some aspects are really striking. When you look uh, at what uh, the Western-shaped democracies are based on today, already, then you find uh, several things which are striking. That is, for example, that um, citizens' rights are bestowed unconditionally. Nobody can take it away from you when you're a citizen. So can you hear me because you're smiling? Okay. <laughs> so nobody can take, uh, take the rights away. And what we find in this uh, um, trust in the citizens is that a, a political community, as the modern nation state is one, um, has to rely on people uh, of, uh, on its people that they would contribute in any sense. The problem today is when it comes to basic income, the objection uh, I mentioned before that it's utopian only refers to the point that we regard as a contribution paid work. When you talk about contribute to the common welfare, we think about paid work in the first place. And, but that's only half or a third of the story. There are a lot of forms of contributing to the common welfare we already have today, like child rearing and families. That's the largest amount of hours worked in countries. Or civic engagement, vol voluntary engagement, the part uh, on non uh, NGO, uh, what NGOs uh, offer, for example. Um, but when we talk about, you know, work and uh, what is a, a valuable work, then we talk about paid work. And that, that is uh, the reason why our perspective on basic income is narrowed to that road that contri contributing is only in forms of uh, more or less paid work. But when you come back to the, what I introduced, that we live on, a, on a grounds together that are built upon the idea that citizens' rights are bestowed unconditionally. And then you relate this to the idea of the basic income. Then you can see that both corresponds in a very basic sense. The unconditionality, the basic income asks is the same unconditionality we rely on today when we're living together in a country of citizens and residents. So it's not the utopian idea, not at all. It's very realistic. We can rather say that the idea that welfare or the welfare state has to rely on paid work or a contribution via paid work that's much more utopian and does not uh, correspond to the basic building blocks of democracy M means the way we're living together already. So to my mind, when you broaden the perspective on basic income, then you can simply call it a consequence from the spirit of democracy to rebuild the welfare state in a sense that's adequate to democracy and the status of citizens in that democratic community. That's all about basic income, to my mind. There are a lot of aspects. Some mentioned before the impact on the economy, you mean on social work, on families, on educational processes, the educational system uh, in general, and so on. But I would, I would like to highlight exactly the point that we have a corresponding 
um, spirit between the con unconditionality of the basic income and the unconditionality of citizen rights today in our democracies. That's the most important point. And uh, uh, I apologize for not uh, being able to talk longer about this issue. Uh, I sent Alexandro a paper uh, he may uh, forward to you when you're interested. And I'm uh, prepared for some questions on this point and aspect. Thank you. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Sasha. I'm going to uh, pass off to questions. Uh, does anyone have uh, any questions uh, with respect to what you just heard uh, from Sasha? I see, uh, Vania, I see you basically grinning. Uh, <laughs> too many. What do you come with and try one? Come on. Come on. I need you. Come on. Uh, so Vania is a friend of mine. She's going to basically come over. She actually is spearheading a, an effort to promote a participatory, demo, participatory democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me, um, let, me, uh, let me see if you can see her. Uh, come. Hello. Thank Hello. you for this. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, first of all, I want to correct <laughs> Alexandros. Um, I think we very often fall in the trap of uh, putting adjectives in the word democracy or using the word democracy as a given mm -hmm. uh, in a time and in a society and in a world where it is really not a given. So when you talk about the correlation between happiness, basic income and democracy, um, I actually question how you define democracy and how what are called the democratic states, uh, what are the actual elements within the decision-making processes, the voting systems, the actual extent to which citizens participate in mm -hmm. decision-making. Um, I would like to hear your thoughts about how the word democracy and the different uh, applications or inter interpretations of the, of the word in today's world actually um, how you how you manage this in your research and and the differentiations between uh, the applications of the word which according to me is not applied anywhere in the world right now but you know we can we can discuss that in another event probably <laughs> yeah uh, thank you for the question um yeah first of all uh, you have to look at the constitution of a country that's the first thing to do what says the con con country, uh, constitution about the status of citizens? Who builds the, uh, well, the, the body politic in a country? And uh, that's, uh, in, in, uh, constitutions uh, define what citizenship means. So when you check this, then you find, uh, what, for example, in Germany, in Switzerland, I've done it, and uh, in the US as well, uh, you find that uh, every decision making in a democratic country has to be justified before in front of the body politic means the people the electorate you can say the electorate and uh, it has to to um serve the, the common welfare um you're completely right that today decisions are made which can be criticized, we can be critical with, and we can say, no, it's, that's not common welfare. We, we have a different opinion of common welfare and so on. But, you know, that's not something uh, I would not regard as an objection against that idea of democracy I uh, introduced. It tells you that democracy is not a given and that you always have conflicts between different interests. People look at reality in a different way they have different focus and different goals and um, there is not a, a single right way in a democracy you have procedures that's very important you have checks and balances mean that uh, uh, control of power and so on that's uh, that's all necessary but the, uh, uh, if there's no citizens ethos that people bind to that collectivity and engage and defend democracy then it can't work so you're completely right it's not a given democracy is not a given at all 
And when we talk about uh, uh, right-wing populism in Europe, then we have to keep two things in mind today. One thing is the question, if right-wing populism is the, an the, the, the answer, what was the question? Why did it arise? And we should not ignore it. And the other thing is, yeah, if right-wing populism um, tends to destroy democracy, we should defend democracy, of course. So it's not something you, you simply can take for granted and it will endure over time. No, no it's not. Democracy needs active citizens. The Republican idea of democracy. All right, um, Sasha. Uh, there's a yeah. one more question, and, and uh, I know that you are, uh, uh, you know, you're uh, tired. So I have uh, one more question, and then uh, I'll let you rest. Uh, give me one question. Uh, one minute. If you can. Come. You know, now I'm full of energy, so it's <laughs> <laughs> good because you will need it for this one. My name is Christos de la Sudas. Uh, so the question is, uh, it's about when, when we will have the ability to distribute basic income. The mechanism through which basic income could be distributed would be a powerful tool for somebody who would like to operate against democracy. The ability, because I believe it needs a, a closed electronic currency system or a closed economic system and the ability of the central authority to remove, to, to exclude somebody from basic income and from with, which will be technologically would be very possible, would be a very powerful tool for enforcing authoritarian uh, policies. Because right now there are, there are pockets of entropy in the economic system. There are pockets that State supervision is lax, but uh, in, uh, in a system that everybody gets basic income in an electronic wallet and the central authority knows what they're doing, whether they get it or not, mm -hmm. would be maybe a danger to democracy or maybe a challenge to make democracy to reform or to make something new, of a, a new form of democracy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Yeah, well, you know, that's the problem or the, the dangerous side of any proposal. Uh, it can be misused and used for other purposes. Of course, it can. But, um, you know, to become powerful, you need people who tolerate that you become powerful. So that's what I mentioned before. Democracy is not a, a state of the art simply a fact you know it's a, it's a, like a living organism you know where people have to to uh, defend their own interests in the community and the community against authoritarian takeover that's true uh, so a basic income is not a panacea you know it, it does not turn the world around and we have we're living in harmony and uh, it's like a birthday uh, 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 event and so on, there will be conflicts, but basic income would uh, enable you to spend your time to defend democracy because you don't have to spend your time on doing paid work to earn your income. If the basic income would be high enough, that's one condition, precondition. If it's high enough, you can spend your time on fighting against this authoritarian takeover that would be helpful. But uh, in general, uh, a takeover is possible when citizens do not defend their country. That's the point. That was my answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, he just said that it was a good answer. So I guess you're satisfied. Uh, well, um, uh, I, I, we have, uh, I think, before the next. Uh, before the next uh, present, uh, our, to our next speaker, do we have time? Let's see. Uh, yes, uh, we have time for. I mean, if you if you're not tired, we do have time for one more question. Uh, can you take yeah. it? Good. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. So uh, just wait a minute because she's coming over. Uh, you can say your name before you ask. Yeah. Question.
Hello. Um, Martha Hello. Kalderman. How are you? I study with the University of Freiburg. And there we're studying also social contract theory. And we run some experiments in constitutional economics about universal basic income. And I wanted to ask you if you tried also simulations on the same topic to see from the sociological point of view why people would not choose it. Because for economists, it usually is the problem of justice. Oh, it's not an equal or efficient distribution, therefore they would not choose it. And I wanted to ask you if you have done some kind of research or a simulation on the same topic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, I've done no simulation because I don't, I don't work with simulation models or simulating models. Um, I use um, uh, data like, for example, uh, non-standardized interviews or I uh, analyze speeches and uh, constitutions and so on. Um, for example, to find out how, how people, well, what's the attitude toward basic income, it's very interesting when you analyze interviews, non-standardized interviews, like open conversations. What you, what you often find is that uh, on the one hand, people say, well, basic income, okay, yeah, well, no problem. I like what I do. I like my profession. I like my job. I will continue working. Um, so that's fine with me. But then they add, on the other hand, there are those other people. And I don't know if they would be able to cope with the freedom of basic income. That is very strange, you know, when uh, in the same interview, if someone talks about himself and then he talks about the others. So you find there's a discrepancy, like a contradiction. Uh, in, in the same uh, utterances in the interviews. And that's what you find very often. And even in expertise papers from economists, um, they, you know, what they uh, easily um, uh, uh, agree is that only few people would um, reduce uh, their uh, uh, labor supply. They would keep on working, but there are some. And the, 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 the group of these some people, they regard as a problem. But, you know, that, that's very strange for, for policymaking because policymaking is, uh, has to find rules for, uh, let's say, uh, the general situation and not for uh, the, um, uh, what's the word in English for it? Um, um, those who fall out of the general rule. I just, uh, so it's a, no, can't tell you. Um, so when, when you have decision making is based on finding a general compromise for everybody. And there will always be some uh, who do not follow this compromise. So that's normal. But um, when you turn it around and you, you have an objection to the basic income by saying there would be some who would not keep on working or contributing via paid work. Then it means you, you abolish a, an idea that would be generally or in general a good one because there would be some that in that, in that sense could mit, misuse it. And that's very strange. That's you find, in, 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 for example, in interviews a lot and in expertise papers. That's all I can say about simulations. All right. Um, thank you uh, so much for, um, uh, first of all, coming despite basically uh, your illness and, and uh, answering these questions and making uh, this presentation. Uh, I, 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 again, thank you because I know that uh, it's not easy to speak when you don't feel very well. So um, uh, let's thank uh, Sasha for uh, basically. <laughs> all right. So, uh, yeah. um, now, thank, thank, Alexandros, thank you very much for inviting me. So, and I hope you will have a, a very inspiring discussion in Athens. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we're now waiting for uh, Che Wagner. Uh, so, uh, feel free to uh, log off and, uh, and rest. Or if you want, you can stay and like and listen uh, when Che tries to uh, come in. Um, I, I am in contact with him through my cell phone. Uh, apparently, there was a delay in the airport, and he's in the airport right now, uh, trying to find some Wi-Fi signal and, and uh, like log in. 
um, because she's in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm going to basically message him. I hope uh, he makes it. Uh, can't see you. This is a, a problem of multi location, non locality, I guess. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, yes. Uh, one thing that we could do uh, is Barb actually here? Barb, you're here, right? Uh, let's see. Perhaps uh, we can use this. Uh, yes, perhaps we can use his his uh, uh, his delay and like and basically have you talk since you're here already. Uh, uh, wait a minute. He just joined. Oh, here we go. Okay. He just joined. Okay. Okay. Are you there? Hello. Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Do you hear me? Yes. <laughs> All right, oh, great. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, so why don't you uh, start basically uh, uh, talking before you lose your Wi-Fi signal or something? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> great. Yeah. I'm currently at uh, Washington Dolls Airport, and I hope this works out. So, um, should I just start off with my my points, my presentation? Yeah, why don't you just do a little intro of, of who you are okay, so people okay. have an idea. Yeah, okay. So I'm Wagner from Switzerland. I'm originally from Switzerland, grew up there as well. And getting involved in the basic income referendum there in Switzerland, which was uh, taking place last year, famously, uh, 5th June 2016. So that was the first um, national vote on a universal basic income measure and um, I was uh, involved in on different fields I would say I was uh, uh, with the campaign I was involved but also um, doing research besides that and and really interested in the question not just from a campaigning uh, professional level but also in terms of uh, the progress towards policy so what can we actually do or what are the next steps um, for the basic income to be more comprehensible to be more to be closer to the people so people can really uh, figure out what this is all about so that's uh, basically what I'm uh, interested in right now and yeah I'm still in my masters so um, studying uh, European studies in Basel in Switzerland. I've been studying uh, history of economics in Zurich. Yes, <laughs> that's me. And right now I'm on a trip in the US. I uh, was invited by uh, the State Department, luckily, um, to visit uh, several think tanks here in Washington and across the country. Um, partly also to discuss basic income or what they think about the policy or what they have in mind from different perspectives. Like from progressives, uh, I, I will uh, meet progressive institutions, but as well as um, very conservative institutions actually, like the Cato Institute or others. So that's Jay, me. <laughs> Jay, could you perhaps uh, give us a uh, some of the biggest challenges that you had in uh, like uh, explaining the campaign to like very conservative yeah. people. <laughs> now we <laughs> here. So maybe the most uh, to start off, maybe the most uh, important thing about our campaign and also the referendum in its whole was we we didn't uh, design a majority campaign. So we didn't count on. Uh, we didn't dream of having a majority behind this. Uh, it was really the chance was really to discuss something on a on a level of more of um, imagine people imagining something in the future. So it was in that sense a visionary referendum, and that was consciously done so by us. So um, as you might know, the Swiss and Switzerland is very known to be maybe one of the most conservative countries in the world. Um, um, uh, yeah, one of, the, one of the effects of direct democracy is really people um, thinking twice. So um, our history of direct democracy 
uh, which goes back to 1891. Um, and there were a total of 206 national votes since then. You were actually majority votes. So you can imagine um, not like some, some game uh, where you can just um, maybe compare it to, to lobbying or um, representative democracy. It's really hard work, and you have to to find majorities. You have sometimes you have to do it over twenty or thirty years. So that's more our um, kind of path to go. That's our perspective. What um, in the referendum and, and through the campaign was, yeah, what you just asked, like how did people react? What did they what did they like about the basic income, or where, where were points where they th thought, where people thought, oh, this is actually something leading towards the future, and other points um, just thought this is not going to happen. So we did this representative surveys um, right after the vote, asking people, so what were your you know, arguments for the basic income, and what were arguments against it? and. Ones that were against, uh, like the main argument against the basic income referendum was not really surprising. So people, um, to a large extent, didn't believe in um, how, how, like the financing model. So people wouldn't, wouldn't get, okay, how is this going to implement it? Uh, what kind of taxation uh, t takes place then? So people wouldn't, partly wouldn't um, get what what the solution would be, and partly didn't believe in the solutions we offered. One big point, and then the second point, which is, it, I would argue, the second point is maybe the most um, the hardest point <laughs> for like every basic income movement in the world is um, a very strong feeling. So we ask people. Um, do you think that if uh, given somebody can work in general, should he, if the person is able to work, um, should we, um, should this pay, uh, should this person um, work, or is it okay if this person takes time off? Like in a general sense, we ask that, and um, over ninety percent um, said yeah. So. Basically, we should, if people don't, if people are, uh, don't do that, we should actually press them to work. Um, so that's a very strong indicator uh, where in terms of um, um, kind of the, the basic values of people towards basic income. Um, that's, yeah, that's maybe, so, the identification is strong, especially in Switzerland, of course, but also across across the world. And um, work is seen really as only legit, le uh, legit kind of way to, to earn an income. So there we have, I think, the, parad the paradigm will manifest itself there. How can we find... Um, you know, slogans or ways to talk about that so that we, we go forward there. So that's my main point uh, um, with the argument against the basic income. And for us, at least, we didn't expect that, at least, was the main argument for, uh, to vote for uh, universal basic income was really technological change in general. So, um, yeah, I, I don't have to go deep into that, I guess. I mean, uh, kind of the feeling that we're in the beginning of a transformation and new kind of, uh, new kind of lifestyles uh, will have to be defined in the future. Really voted yes, because they had the general feeling that there needs to be a reform in the future. Maybe not right, right now, um, but... Um, they were very positive towards more thinking about how we can answer those developments. 
by far the main argument. There were other arguments for basic income. Another one was um, people would say um, basic income would give more value to volunteer work or household work. To over 60% actually um, um, would argue for basic income because of that argument. And uh, a smaller portion of people would say um, the basic income is a good thing because it replaces um, or partly replaces, actually, that's what we did in the survey, partly replaces um, the social welfare system as it is now, which is too complicated or there's many reasons for that. So that are the reasons um, that were brought up by this representative survey for basic income. And um, I think maybe it is interesting in this discussion here to talk a little bit about um, so my, my intention also with the survey was to find out, okay, what kind of person or what kind of groups or even uh, movements vote um, for a basic income in, in Switzerland at least. So deeper into that and um, data there and there's a lot of um, possibilities to, to find out more about that. but. Uh, Essentially, what I did is kind of articulate three different uh, groups who were clearly for, but who voted for basic income. So those groups have a, a certain um, mixture of values and maybe related to age as well. They, um, so the majority of those groups voted for basic income, like a large majority, like over 60%. And the first group is um, the group which age is 55 to 65. So those people, 10 years before retirement, pretty much. So those people were str strongly in favor for a basic income. And yeah, we ask ourselves why the case. And the easy answer is really that though this group, this age group really suffered um, from, from the current um, economy and job market. But, you know, in Southern Europe, it's, it's even stronger, of course, but, but also in Northern Europe, like Switzerland, um, this age group has uh, really problems accessing the job market. So there you have a high, very high uh, approval rate. The second group is what I would call the... So those are essentially people from the born in the 60s. Um, so people uh, who would, by a large extent, be part of the green um, movement, but also just uh, progressive, open-minded leftist kind of um, supporters. And uh, we could even call UBI or uh, basic income maybe as, as, as their, as a key, could be a key project of post-materialist movement. Um, yeah, we can maybe get later more into that, but it's very interesting that you, you'll you find um, a large approval rate amongst um, kind of green leftist uh, groups. And then you have a third group, and that group can be uh, described as the avant-garde. It's kind of, or we, we could also call them experiment um, how do you call it, experiment for uh, like open towards experiments. And um, the, those are people who work in projects mainly. So people who participate in the gig economy, they, you, partly you can also describe them as digital nomads. So it was, if you would belong to that group statistically, it, it is very likely you voted yes for UBI. So those are, mainly like the core the core groups or even movements that would approve uh, for universal basic income in Switzerland, which is maybe interesting also in a global context. I think those are basically the, the groups we are looking at um, thinking of, of more, more to come, more policy to come. So finally, um, 
like as my conclusion, my question is really, and, and I'm, I'm finishing with a question, not with a, a statement really, is my question is really how can we continue uh, the efforts? Um, so I really ask that myself after the vote. Uh, actually, um, uh, Chair, I, uh, in, in fact, uh, I was thinking of, uh, of uh, asking you something uh, along those lines in the sense that perhaps, yeah. some people in yeah. the, perhaps some people in the audience might be thinking, uh, uh, you know, how would you uh, design a basic a campaign for basic income, perhaps uh, uh, in, I mean, I'm, obviously you're not Greek, but if somebody in Greece wanted to, to design a campaign for basic income, yeah, yeah. Given what you've learned, uh, what sort of advice would you give to them so that they yeah, don't make the yeah. same mistakes you did, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. Um, like generally speaking, I would say we were, um, we were, and that, that is an honest answer. We were really surprised by our success. We didn't expect that much success. Um, we had, um, you know, we had surveys like a year before. Um, the vote happened saying, you know, 9, 11% would approve. So we have a very successful campaign um, behind us. Um, and it was a very good decision, in my opinion at least, to have a very open discussion. So we didn't really go into details how, you know, what, what the actual model is, how you would know, economically speaking, um, how you would implement uh, on a detailed level the basic income, but it was more like, okay, those are the three new, you know, amendments in the constitution, we, we are, um, and um, if people vote yes, that would mean the inscription in the constitution, so we would have to come up with plans how to actually implement it. And the good, the good thing about this is really that, oh, it's not like a specific um, corner you can draw the basic income into. So it's not, oh, the, those are the leftist people who want to, you know, who want to um, cut the one percent, um, like the rich, and and you know, redistribute money through that. And it is not a libertarian kind of approach where, it's, you know, government to just um, get rid of social security. So we were, we were very um, cautious about too early getting into a corner kind of. Um, and I think that was a very good decision. Oh, that's my opinion. Because then much more quality. You, you don't just talk about, um, you know, uh, the light left, left kind of uh, fight uh, over how to come up with taxes or how to tax whatever the rich or or the middle class so it was not about that but really about um, so really about the question okay what happens if everybody had these uh, basic income and the, a ground builder so now we really have kind of a, a frame where we can get more specific or um, also on local levels, uh, we can argue much better these um, insights in how people react to something like that. First advice, keep it, keep it open if possible. And the second advice would really be, you have to create something real. Um, I believe, like, of course, in, in Switzerland we have this wonderful tool called direct democracy that's not like available everywhere if you do if you think about doing a campaign you should really think very well about how to involve people people active um, not just on a kind of lobby but also on a very real level Mostly that is possible on local levels. Um, that's what I experienced. For example, in the US, you have some states, for example, where you, can, where you could uh, put up a ballot or a referendum. Um, and I think those are the most powerful campaigns you can do because people are actually, um, yeah, people are, can actually get involved and do a different, like make a difference. And 
um, only um, you know advertisement for an idea or so, such something like that. Yeah, the chances are that you know it's it's nice to talk about it, but um, it's always nice to talk about basic income. When I mean, yeah, like every uh, media outlet in the world maybe talked about basic income last year, but um, it's another thing to post something where people can existentially wade in. So that's that would be my advice for, for a campaign. And then maybe more specific, I mean, our campaign, we didn't do any advertisement. Um, we just created events or, you know, performances. And that was a very good strategy as well. But I mean, that's more detailed into, you know, how to design a campaign. Do you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're gonna hear you. So essentially, what what you're saying is that uh, like you, you didn't like pay any money for ad advertising. You just organized events in different parts of Switzerland, and people responded. Is that how it worked? Yeah, that worked pretty really well. I mean, we have a, a long history of that, so we um, we really count on that. I mean, instead of you know, instead of buying like advertisements in newspapers, for example, or wherever in TV events that were so interesting or so I don't know overwhelming or <laughs> um, that yeah kind of journalists couldn't like turn their heads away and they had to kind of report on that the truck is one is one famous thing we did but there were also smaller things um, you know we had a golden Tesla for example so the campaign suddenly owned we, we didn't own it really but uh, we claimed we owned the golden tesla which was outrageous right because why would you know those lefty activists own a tesla which is gold <laughs> everybody talked about it and in talking about it they had to talk about the basic income as well so that was kind of, kind of our catch um because we didn't have the money, you know, to nationally advertise for basic income, which would be boring as well. Um, so we just created those those things. Um, or another example is we instead of advertise um, with posters, uh, which is traditionally made in Switzerland, you, you just uh, you, you uh, rent those, you know, rent those places where you can hang up the posters and that instead of that we just created this this largest poster ever uh, with crowdfunding so it was a kind of a crowd effort and once we displayed this one poster of course everybody would print the photo of that so that was essentially our poster campaign like we tricked kind of we we tricked the system and it worked well it worked pretty well so basically, you crowdfunded a, a poster that then then everybody basically like printed the poster and put it at their cities. Is that is that how it worked? No, no, it worked through the media. Like we, I don't know. Have you never seen the, the photo with what would you work uh, if your income was taken care of? I remember. Are you talking about the the poster that essentially the giant uh, poster in China? Uh, yeah. That that went on the Guinness Book of Records, right? Yeah, exactly. That is this poster. Which was a lot of work, of course, but it didn't cost us anything because of crowdfunding. So people believed in that, and uh, you know, would donate towards that. And um, you know, it would still cost around 150, 200 thousand euros. But I mean, a poster campaign, on the other hand, would have cost like more than a million in Switzerland. So it was really a cheap way to and. And you know the international media was there, and, and certainly the Swiss media. So we had that. We kind of that was a very good strategy in that case because on the poster was our slogan. I'm so as to, soon as somebody, I'm gonna try to bring up a, a you know picture what I mean? of that. I'm gonna try to bring up a picture of that poster so people have an idea. Let me see if I can find it somewhere. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. You can uh, just. Have, uh, Basic income, Geneva, or whatever. You'll find it. Yeah. 
Let's see. Uh, yeah, that's it. Music and composer. There you go. Uh, the, uh, the, the audience can see it. It's, it's, it's massive. I don't know if you guys can see it. Uh, it's the biggest ever, yeah. It's, it's the biggest poster ever? Yeah, it's the Guinness Book. It's okay. both by the Guinness Book. Yeah. Uh, and, and how much did it cost, you said? I mean, in total, it maybe costs it like maybe 200,000 euros. You said 200,000? Yeah, maybe. but you know, you can still look up the, the crowdfunding uh, page. It's on. Uh, so, so wait a minute. So it started, it, I believe. Let me just like. So we we let me, we we, uh, we crowdfunded that money. So we, we didn't have any costs on our side yeah, for the you campaign. Said, Jay, you you said basically twenty thousand, right? Two hundred thousand, of course. Two hundred thousand. It's huge. Two hundred. It's uh, Swiss francs. Yeah. So 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 uh, yeah, because people here are like are like squinting their eyes. We're talking about two hundred thousand <laughs> yeah. euros, right? Yeah, yeah. But no, the campaign, no, like you, you mean euros, like the European euros, right? Well, yeah, the European ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and by the way, did you get? Yeah, it was what? Did Did you get permission to like uh, from some sort of? Uh, uh, authority to like put it out there, um, or did you just like do it uh, just like that? <laughs> no, we got the permission, of course. Yeah, no, no, it's too big to <laughs> to play around. <laughs> no, it was a huge event. Like, uh, did you did you pay for know, the, thousands of people showed up? Did you pay for the permission to to do that? Because we're like no. some people are asking here. No, you didn't, right? No, no. Oh, that's good. The, the, the city was actually happy to, uh, to have us. I, I don't know whether yeah, like, it's Geneva. I mean. Hey, Geneva. Yeah, I, I don't know whether we actually have a square this uh, this big in Athens to like uh, try to uh, do it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but um, that's, like, that's pretty impressive that you actually raised two hundred thousand like uh, euros for a, a poster. You would have given a little basic income for that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but you have to imagine uh, like six hundred thousand people voted for for us, right? Yeah. A base, and uh, yeah, if each one of those six hundred thousand would give like twenty cents, you're there. The yeah. Project like that. I mean, you have a, you have a very big base as well, so you can do stuff. Um, and what we did second, I don't know if you saw that in Berlin. We put the same poster in Berlin in front of the Brandenburg Tor. Have you seen this? So we, we kind of made a little tour. Um. But uh, yeah, that was, that was the second part of the the action. I see. Uh, tell me, some, tell me something. How it? many how many people were in the organizing team? Just to get have an idea. Uh, uh, so we started very small with the signature collecting, right? We had to collect one hundred thousand signatures, right? In within a, one year. Yeah. And, and we, have a major, you know, party or organization behind us, so we basically started from scratch. Um, now, you know, people would show up more and more, and we kind of um, went more professional. And within the last, I don't know, like eight, nine months, we were, in the, maybe in the beginning, we were like 15 people, and in the end, we were like 25. Okay, so, yeah. so for, for yeah. so what you're saying, uh, I mean, like uh, technically, is that 15 people can uh, succeed in uh, essentially gathering more than 100,000 uh, uh, signatures in a country like Switzerland, uh, and um, the top you got was 25 people. I just want basically yeah, to like, uh, I just want to repeat that because uh, it's not a lot of people. You can get that amount of people to actually do that work uh, in any country. So it's good to have. If it's just, matter, if, yeah, that's true. That's right. I mean, I don't know whether there's a. Uh, it's, it depends not, it's not on the 15, uh, And it's not 15 people collecting the 100,000 signatures. And that's true. It's just those people who are, would organize the collecting. Mm -hmm. So, in total, more than maybe like 150 or something like that would, would collect like often. And maybe 500 occasionally, a lot of people. But it's just, it's about organizing, really. 
So you need to organize the people who would collect the signatures. That's, yeah, that's basically what you need. And it's very hard. I mean, you know, on a European level, there was, I think two years ago, there was an attempt to collect the one million signatures, right? Because it's just, you know, it's, it's crazy work. It's, it's just a lot of work. Uh, but if now, you, yeah. uh, now, basically, we're at, at uh, 9.20, and I want to open it up uh, for questions yeah. uh, for anyone in the audience who uh, potentially wants to run a campaign like this or um, is, is yep. interested basically in, in your experience. So I'm going to open up the questions uh, in case anyone has uh, any. Uh, can you please... Uh, a short question you can ask. Okay. I didn't quite understand. Was there an estimate of cost offered okay. by the campaign? And can I repeat? Suggestions as to where that money will come from? I, I will, uh, I'm going to repeat basically because uh, she, she was far away and uh, she said, was there a suggested estimate of the cost for uh, like in pulling off the basic income in Switzerland and uh, what else? And, and, a suggestion as to where that money and then also a, a suggestion as to uh, where that money would come from in, in your particular proposal. Yeah, you mean like if, if there was a particular number we knew when we had this number we had a majority, is that the question? Or no, is the question no. how much did we have? No, no, it, it was a question basically is with respect to what would be the estimated costs in, in terms of money uh, for a basic income to be a reality in Switzerland and what sort of strategies oh, yeah. uh, would make that happen. Okay. You mean campaign wise, right? N not basic income costs, like if we implement it. <laughs> no, that's, I'm talking about, 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 the, the, about the cost basically of, uh, of making it happen in Switzerland. Of the, the, the policy yeah, right. of the campaign policy well uh, that's I mean yeah if I knew that <laughs> I think you know we, we spent um, over a million in total uh, you know with the, all the donations and we had the 23 percent right so you could if you had double of that <laughs> maybe we pull it off but that's not true right because we had Chair, I, I, don't, I, I don't know whether uh, you understood the question. The question was not basically about the cost of the campaign. It was about the, uh, it would be, what would be the total cost uh, for uh, implementing the in, in Switzerland? Okay, okay, sorry, sorry, yeah. Um, like the effective cost would be maybe, maybe around 3% of what, uh, of, of what the actual cost is. So let me explain that. So we have, we always said, okay, the total package to have everybody have a basic income is around a third of the GDP, of Swiss GDP, like 33, maybe, maybe a little less, 30% of GDP. And the Swiss GDP is around 600 billion, which is very high for a small country, but um, it's around that. and. I think in other countries we have similar. We're looking at similar uh, percentages of the so GDP. This is the so the total cost, the total me, cost would be. Uh, uh, give me one, one second because the person who asked the question actually walked over here, and I think he wants to clarify. Uh, Hello, Che. This is Vikentius. Uh, there were reports in the press that the cost of the scheme of the, uh, of the uh, guaranteed um, uh, income would be about three yeah. times the budget of the federal government. And, and, uh, and that couldn't be possibly, that couldn't be funded. Is, is that true? I mean, that's what the no, Financial Times right. reported. The Financial Times? No, that's of course not true. I mean, maybe some, some on the opposite would say that because, you know, it's their campaign to do that and it's their right to do that. But um, in general, we can say, okay, we have a third of the GDP in Switzerland, which is around 200 billion Swiss francs. And that's the total investment for basic income. Right. Around a third, a third of that 200 billion is already transferred in terms of social security, right? So you have around 70 billion who are already covered to the state, right? Because most studies, um, most studies show that the cost of such a scheme would be less than what governments are paying for social security schemes. In other Today. words, it would be cheaper 
That's why I was yeah. I was interested in whether in your proposal you said, look, what we are proposing will cost X amount of Swiss francs, and each person will get X amount of uh, of, of money, because also reports that uh, that yeah. I read about your effort was that the suggested uh, income monthly income was uh, something like two thousand and three hundred uh, exactly. uh, euros. Is that true? Thank you. Well, that's true. And that's, that's a very low proposal. You have to imagine, Switzerland is crazy expensive. I live in Switzerland, right? And if you want to have, you know, a three-room apartment, you will pay most likely more than 2,000 Swiss francs for that. Very high. And 2,500 is like really the minimum of... It's comparable to 1,000 US dollars in America. So, but uh, you're right. I mean, uh, implementing a basic income after all, in the midterm, it's, it's going to be cheaper. I think the main difference between our and other schemes, which are discussed, you know, in Finland, for example, or other places, um, the main difference is we really want the whole deal. So we proposed a basic income for everyone, not just for people who are on Social Security or people who are uh, disabled or uh, there's different approaches to that. So our scheme was really, okay, everybody that is an inhabitant, an inhabitant in Switzerland would get uh, the basic income with our proposal. And I think that's the main difference to, to other proposals where, which are discussed right now. And I am a strong supporter of an universal basic income and not a uh, basic income for a certain group or, you know, for the poor. Um, I'm actually against that. I even see a danger in that even. But it's that's up for discussion. <laughs> Okay, so um, uh, there's uh, just uh, two minutes before we take a break. Do you have a question? Go ahead. Oh, of course, there is, there is. So we have more, one more question, and then uh, you're uh, yeah. free to uh, take an app or something. I don't know. Uh, so. Okay, hello, Jay. Um, so your effort was based on your uh, constitutional right to gather signatures and initiate a referendum, which uh, in our case in, is not a, a right we have. Uh, based on the Greek constitution. Uh, on, on the other side, in Switzerland, that right uh, has been arguably causing a democratic fatigue uh, to Swiss citizens who are constantly asked to participate in different sorts of referenda. And I wanted to ask whether your campaign was affected by this fatigue, if it is something you believe that um, is an argument, and uh, whether you think or whether you think that your constitutional right to gather signatures and initiate referenda is a, has a more hopeful future for uh, Switzerland. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there is no fatigue. <laughs> That's a simple answer. Um, as you can break that down in numbers if you want, but generally speaking, Swiss, the Swiss um, are voting uh, four times a year. That's that's the normal kind of cycle of things in Switzerland. And you know, we have we have sometimes we have very low um, you know very low turnouts on those votes. So you're right. Maybe people are fatigued, right? So we have like 30, 40 percent um, turnout sometimes. In the in the case of basic income, it was higher because you know it was a, a very radical. Um, Sorry, can you repeat um, what what was the what was the percentage of oh. participation? In the ballot? The percentage of participation in, uh, in the Swiss case, uh, in the basic income case, was around 50%, which is very high. Um, and you would think, oh no, this is not high, right? But the thing is, um, you have a situation where, where you can, you don't have to vote every time, right? So if you look at numbers, um, so how many times does a citizen in Switzerland vote over a year, that is at least once or twice. It's like one point something. 
and you have an eighty percent turnout within a year. So the Swiss democracy is very alive. Um, it's just that people won't, you know, won't every time, which is fine. Which is totally fine. I, I totally believe, for example, in liquid democracy. So those people who, who are kind of experts on the field or who feel like, oh, this is an important issue, they go and vote. Um, others just don't, and that's fine. And I think we, we do really well with that system. Okay. So in general, I, I would say no, there's no fatigue. And I would really encourage um, everybody to try whatever they can do politically to bring it because basic income as a nucleus like a, as a nucleus idea is basically a right it's a right it's to and it's all those uh, projects towards um, replacing welfare for example in Finland I think that's a very dangerous kind of development um, I'm really interested in data they produce but at the same time you're looking at um, you're looking at basically government trying to shut down some of the programs that were you know created um, with the help of of this shiny thing called basic income and I, I don't believe in that I think that we should really focus on discussing basic income as a basic right I don't know how that is possible in Greece. I don't really know, but I think that's most important. Discuss Maybe we need the referendum right. as a basic right first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what we're looking at in Germany, right? I mean, same problem in Germany. All right. Uh, so, uh, Che, thank you uh, very much um, for your participation, even though you were at the airport. Uh, sorry for keeping you there for so long. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Uh, thank you. Uh, so thank you so much for participating. Uh, I'm going to basically uh, um, uh, now make it a little break. Uh, you can obviously stay in, uh, and and listen to Barb and and the other speakers later. But uh, yeah. I know that you're tired and you're in an airport, so uh, you know you're free. Yeah. Obviously, you're free to go. I don't want to like tire you more. So thank you once more okay. for uh, for. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, uh, so um, uh, uh, Barb, I, I want to basically, can you hear me? Barb? Hello? Yeah, Yeah. hi, I can, Yeah. Uh, I'm so, just uh, turning my so, video. So I want to take us, uh, uh, okay. hi, Please. I'm going to basically uh, give the audience uh, a 10 minute break because your talk uh, is yeah, due sure in like 10 minutes. So uh, let everybody basically just relax for a bit, perhaps talk among themselves because they've been listening to and seeing screens for like uh, the past hour or so. And in 10 minutes, um, I'm gonna basically uh, restart the event. I'm gonna leave everything just as is. So just like, you know, okay, so I'll, your just, I'll just stay on. Yeah, yeah, in 10 minutes, we'll start again, I'll okay? I'll just stay on, yeah. Thank okay, you. cool. Great, Great. So I'll see you in a bit. Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, if you would uh, please uh, take a seat so we can start. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna basically put you at the as the main speaker right now. Uh, okay. So, okay. So everybody can see you now uh, and can hear you. So that's great. Uh, so everybody is silent. So let's start. Okay. Uh, you're good to go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is a brilliant opportunity. Um, and there's a little bit of feedback. I don't know. Anyway, sorry. If I get a bit caught up with that, then don't worry. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Barb Jacobson. I'm on the uh, board of uh, Unconditional Basic Income Europe. Um, and I'm really, really happy to be speaking again with our friends in Greece. And I hope to be able to come back soon for sure. Um, just to say, uh, Unconditional Basic Income Europe is an alliance of uh, people and organizations in, a, in what was 25, but now coming to be 27 countries across Europe. Uh, we grew out of the, uh, the European Citizens Initiative in 2013, and uh, we managed to get about uh, 300,000 signatures across Europe for that. That wasn't enough. Uh, the million is, is needed for um, basically an audience with the, with the European Commission. And we were asking them just to look into basic income. We weren't at the time asking them to um, put a basic income out for everybody at that stage. 
Um, but just to go through what's going on in Europe, it's been really uh, amazing the last couple of years for sure. Um, just a couple of things I'll be talking about pilots. Um, I'll be talking about uh, political moves and also I'll be talking about um, uh, some EU wide initiatives that, that uh, we're starting, starting with at uh, Basic Income Europe. Okay, so for the pilots, um, it's the situation is really interesting. Uh, we have uh, obviously there's the famous pilot in Finland, um, but it, I should say for that that it's not really a basic income. I think Che kind of flagged that up earlier. Um, it's just being given to people who are who are unemployed, and uh, this was actually against the recommendation of the of Kela, which was the commission that. Uh, that, that designed, that helped the government uh, design things. Um, and they're actually trying to get uh, pe more people included in that. So, so we'll, see, we'll see how that goes. But what's happening in Finland is basically they're removing conditions, um, a certain amount of conditionality from current unemployment benefits and uh, seeing whether people are more likely to get jobs. And that's really what the government's interested in that. Uh, not the other sorts of effects that you've heard about uh, that that basic income could that a real universal basic income could could offer. Um, other places are looking into pilots. Uh, there's also been quite a lot of excitement about what's going on in the Netherlands, uh, where several uh, localities are looking into basic income or doing a pilot in their own. Um, and these all, yeah, I mean, because every every country is a bit different in the way they they deal with with uh, social security. Um, and in, it depends on what they can do. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, in France, there are two regions, Normandy and Aquitaine, who are looking into doing pilots. Um, there's a privately run funded or a, a, a pilot that's funded by, by a charity in Denmark. Um, and that's had some really interesting results so far, particularly since they've been working quite, uh, quite well with the civil servants there. I mean, there's a big thing with basic income that you know, we'll get rid of all the bureaucracy. Um, but actually, I think there's a, quite a lot, there'll be quite a lot to do to repair the damage. I mean, if, once we do get basic income. And so we'll, and one thing that's interesting about the Denmark pilot is that the civil servants are much happier because they're able to help people rather than, than just police them as, as they are in, in, most, in most current minimum income schemes. In Spain, there are several regions looking into pilots, uh, particularly uh, in the Basque country, where I'm not sure it's even a pilot. I think they're just pressing to, to get it. Um, and then in Barcelona, uh, the city there is looking at uh, doing a, a basic income for children um, and, for, and for women. So that should be interesting. Um, here in the UK, I'm speaking from London, by the way, here in the UK, uh, uh, local councillors in, in Glasgow and Fife up in Scotland are, um, have been very publicly uh, talking about their basic income, how they would like to do a basic income pilot there. And again, that you know will depend on, on some uh, sort of either central government or the, the Scottish Assembly government uh, involvement. Um, in Europe, the political discussion though is, is, going, is going extremely well. Uh, people may have heard that uh, that Benoit have Amon in in France uh, has been has been selected as the socialist candidate there, and he's a, um, he's been speaking a lot about basic income during during his campaign. So it it's really kind of raised the issue um, to a higher level, and it's kind of had a kind of knock on effect in the UK, where the Labour Party here is is now the very recent, just in the last day or so, has announced that they're doing an investigation into basic income and, and to see whether this is a policy they could adopt. Um, and yeah, there sort of seem to be more and more parties that are, are looking into it more and, and also supporting it. And then there are also parties uh, specifically about basic income, basically, you know, we are the basic income party type of thing. Um, these are rising in Sweden and Germany and Slovenia that I know of. Um, I think there's also one in the Netherlands. Um, and the thing is, is that um, I think most most people, as Che was talking about, it, you know, most people realize that the that the world of work is changing very rapidly, um, and that something is going to have to be, you know, to be put in place so that that people actually can exist um, and and participate in both um, political and economic and economic life. 
Uh, on the EU level, we're certainly working quite hard to to raise the issue, and whenever we have a chance, we'll you know to go to meetings uh, about say the future of work and and other aspects. Uh, we'll we we put in a word for basic income. Uh, there are a couple of campaigns uh, which are interesting. Uh, you'll hear from Mein Grundan um later on, uh, but I also wanted to mention a, a campaign we support called Kiwi for People which is focused on the ECB and saying that, that the, all the money and the many billions of euros that have been going into, into supporting the banks uh, really ought to be going into people's pockets or go into infrastructure projects. Um, and that's been gaining a lot of traction amongst um, many economists across Europe and, um, and has, is really making a noise up, up, up in Brussels. Um, we're also doing ongoing research uh, into the idea of a euro dividend. Uh, Philippe Van Parej uh, talk, uh, wrote a paper about this about oh, nearly 10 years ago now, but uh, we're, we're actually starting to do serious re research into this and hopefully um, something in the next year or so will be coming out about it. Uh, there has also been a very interesting initiative, uh, which is from France, but it's uh, made made waves throughout Europe, uh, which is an idea for an agricultural basic income. I don't know if people are aware about the um, iniquities of, of the common agricultural policy, but it does it does serve mainly to support large farming um, or large large farms, and um, and to the to the point where uh, small farmers are are really going to the wall. Um, <clears throat> so the idea there is is to use uh, the the, com the money from the common agricultural policy, which is one of the biggest parts of the of the uh, European the um, EU budget, uh, to to actually you know support all farmers and and agricultural um, agricultural initiatives. Um, and let's see what else. Um, I think uh, the. You know, we're basically we're being invited to to come along to more and more discussions, um, not just at the EU but also at the Council of Europe. Uh, whenever the future of work is discussed, and or even and minimum income, um, uh, we're we're starting to uh, get in on get in on those discussions, and it's it's been it's been really interesting. Um, the late, you know, the latest thing is that it it was re it was recommended recently in a in a report into um, the 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 technological change in the workplace, um, you know, that the robots are coming for our jobs, that we should have uh, some form of basic income. Uh, we do need to keep up the pressure, however, and keep up our spirits. There's uh, quite a lot of nasty politics going on in Europe at the moment. And uh, I really do feel that basic income is, is a really good answer to, um, to start to austerity and uh, and to this kind of attack on the, this kind of war on the imagination that, that David, Gra David Graeber has, has spoken about, that, that basic income is like a kind of uh, the imagination striking back. Um, I know personally from, from work I do, uh, with, we've done here in the UK in the streets, that um, when people get basic income, when they get the idea of, when they understand the idea of, of basic income, uh, they get really excited and they start talking about other, other things, other problems that they, that they maybe didn't didn't feel that they that they could uh, even think about before. So I think that the um, the time is really interesting and and really exciting. And I think with with all the different initiatives that are going on, um, that that we will we will make it. Now whether it's five years or ten years is another question. But um, but I think it's it's going to happen one way or the other. So I'm happy to take questions. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> that was thank a bit you. quick. I hope people understood that. Well, I, there was a lot of information that was given, and I, I think you gave a general overview that there's a lot of uh, activity throughout Europe with respect yeah. to uh, basic income policies. Uh, one question that I have that, um, I mean, I don't want to like abuse my uh, privilege as a moderator, but if I may, <laughs> so, uh, one question that uh, I have, uh, because you are in contact with uh, uh, people in the European Commission, perhaps, uh, and generally the people who are enforcing austerity in Greece, is mm. what happens when you mention basic income as an alternative to austerity to those politicians? Because we've been hearing uh, like no, 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 generally mm. with respect to any sort of uh, suggestion other than austerity. So I'm just wondering, like, you know, what sort of reaction do, do, they, uh, do you get when you propose stuff like basic income to them? 
Right. Well, uh, the conservative politicians, uh, you know, are great, greatly believe that it's not, that uh, there is no money for it. Um, and uh, we had a really good response. Uh, we were at the Council of Europe a couple of weeks ago and we had a fantastic response from a labor, a labor politician um, who, who said, well, you know, don't tell me about no money. You know, we just had that Oxfam report where eight people in the world own as much wealth as, as 50 percent of the rest of the world. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's mixed response about that, but I think the, the idea that there isn't the money for it is really starting to break down. I mean, we've had the Pan Panama Papers and, and various other kinds of evidence that, that there certainly is the money in the world. Um, you know, I mean, you can get into a kind of philosophical discussion about what is money and whether, you know, whether it's a really limited thing because it's just a human idea, it's a human resource, it's not that we've made up, it's not something that's uh, limited by by the real amount of it. Um, on the left, uh, there are worries about uh, the, you know, the, the it's by people kind of being stuck in, in the idea that, that everybody needs jobs. Um, uh, what we're trying to do also is make the case that, that there's an awful lot of, of free work already going on, and particularly in families, um, that, that isn't really being counted as work. Uh, and why, why are we forcing people who would rather look after their families uh, to go into a job? I mean, particularly women, obviously, but I think more and more men are realizing that, in fact, well, they want to do that kind of work as well. So, um, yeah, does that answer your question? <laughs> I've kind of, but I mean, I think the thing is, there's, there's a lot of worry in Europe. I mean, it's not just about the kind of rising nationalism, um, but it's also about the the, the rising insecurity of, of income and work and um, and then the you know the technological uh, advances which are which will are potentially put put people out of a lot of work so I, I understand I mean uh, it's good that uh, we have no money like arguments is slowly starting to crumble uh, because that at least yeah. is, uh, some hope I well, it's just such it's such a weird thing, okay, that 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 we we talk about the earth as though it's like unlimited and we talk about money as though it's limited when in fact it's opposite. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, I yeah, anyway, yeah, carry on. That, that's true, that's true. So, uh, Mira now is on the line. I wonder though um, if there is like, a, perhaps can take one question uh, from the audience if, if there is any. Uh, is there any question for Barb before she checks out? No? question okay so it seems that we have no question okay. for you at the moment uh okay but we're on schedule so that you know that's a cons any consolation fantastic amazing okay <laughs> <laughs> I, I am i am uh, fascinated myself so i, I want to thank you for uh, like uh, listening in and offering your, pers pers your perspective and overview uh it, it's been a, a privilege to hear you and um uh just thank you so much uh, well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I'll carry on. Yay. Thank you. All right. So now I'm going to switch over to uh, Mira. Uh, let me... Uh, uh, okay, Mira, can, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Ah, perfect. Can, can you see me? Because... Okay, so if you open your... We could see you before, but if you open okay. your camera, uh, if you open your camera again, uh, we would be able to see you. Uh, so that's... Uh, okay. Now, basically, we can see you. Yes, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, that's great. Uh, I just want to do a little intro for some people, perhaps, who haven't read that about. So, Mira um, is part of this organization in Germany that uh, crowdfunds and then offers uh, 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 through a, a lottery or... Um, I, I have the Greek word, but I can't remember. Uh, mm -hmm. Raffle, raffle, right? Yeah. yeah. Through a raffle, basically, the basic income. So, they've already actually given a basic income to 74 people. Uh, and I thought that this would be a fitting ending to this event, given that we started with theoretical uh, perspectives on uh, basic income, but now we go to a real uh, scenario on the ground where 74 people actually got the basic income. And Mira is going to talk to us about the perspective, both of the people who received the income and the people who gave the money for that income, plus the organizational insights that they gathered uh, through this effort. So thank you so much for joining us, and I'm leaving it up to you. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. Um, and it's really great to see how the debate picks up speed internationally, um, because we've been working on this topic for so long. 
So I'm going to say two sentences about myself. Um, I've been working for my Grundeinkommen or my basic income for the last one and a half years after I've graduated from the London School of Economics with a degree in political sociology. And I actually started out in the organization with a little experience experiment myself because I started out as an unconditional intern which means I received sort of a basic income 1000 euros a month um, but it wasn't attached with any conditions so I could basically work how much I wanted and what I wanted so I could choose <laughs> my own working hours and everything which really helped me to understand the idea of basic income. And it also tells you a little bit about our organizations that we try things like that. So I want to tell you a little bit about the idea behind our project and why it's working out so well. And I want to give you some insights in the experience um, of, of our winners and the insights we got through this experiment. So, my Grundeinkommen was founded because we wanted to inspire a broader debate about this, about this idea of basic income because we in our team believe that it's really the future of um, the welfare state and it's an answer to a lot of the problems we see in uh, Western societies but also in, in other societies around the world. Um, and what makes it so powerful, I'm sure you've talked about it. For us, basically, it's the combination of giving security to people and freedom at the same time. And we think that this really helps people to develop their potential within the labor market as we know it, but also beyond. However, as you all know, <laughs> there are also a lot of problems uh, around this idea, for example, that for most people, it's still a very abstract concept, which you can see in the debate because it's always, always um, it's called this utopia, um, this, this abstract philosophical idea. Um, and many people think, yes, in a perfect world, you know, <laughs> where everything worked out, um, people could just get free money and have a happy life. And also there are a lot a lot of dominant social beliefs, um, especially about the importance and value of paid labor that still contradict the values behind basic income. For example, especially in Germany, I don't know how it's in Greece or in other countries, but I can imagine it's a little bit um, the same. Um, this very strong idea that you somehow have to earn your income, that you have to show that you're deserving of your income. And there's this very strong connection between your job, your social status, and yeah, your very identity, your very idea of who you are. And there are a lot of fears about the devaluation of labor, especially for old people who've been working all their lives and who've been working for their basic income, their, their pension, and who are afraid that a basic income will devalue this, this lifelong, very hard work. And there are no strong concepts for lives beyond the labor market. There are not a lot of people um, who, who've been able to live without a job and still have meaningful lives, as, um, maybe except for women, um, but they indirectly still depend on the labor of their men still. Then there's another problem, which is um, the mistrust in other people. So we found uh, in a lot of debates that when you ask people, what would you do if your income was taken care of? A lot of people, they have a lot of ideas. And most people tell you that they would keep working. And then in the next sentence, they will tell you, but you know, the other people, they will probably stop working. And, and there's this idea that, that the whole responsibility for, for keeping society and the economy running will will end up in your hands because the, the other people will just opt out and, I don't know, spend their lives on the couch somehow. Uh, and this is really a big problem if we really want to achieve, you know, the realization of basic income. And then a lot of other problems. So the idea behind mein Grundeinkommen or my basic income is... Um, 
yeah, that we want to get engaged in this debate. And now I want to tell you about how we do that. Um, our idea was to launch a hybrid project and the hybrid, what makes it hybrid is that it's both an experiment because people really receive basic incomes and get to have this experience for one year. They get 1000 euros a month for one year, but it's not really a scientific experiment. It's more a campaign because we tell the stories of those people and we want to get as many people engaged in the debate as possible. So as you already told uh, everyone, we crowdfund and refer out basic incomes on a regular basis. And so far we've crowdfunded 74 basic incomes over the course of two and a half years. In addition, on our website, we're building a big community, which we keep engaged because we ask them to register every time uh, we raffle out these basic incomes. So every month or every couple of months, and they're asked to, you know, to get on our website and to deal with this issue, to read the stories and to, to watch the raffles in our live streams. And we have a lot of campaigns and um, different tools which people can use to support us and this debate. And so far on our platform, My Basic Income, we have more than 350,000 users, which is, which is huge. And in our last raffle in December, there were 200,000 people who applied um, for the raffle. And um, at this point, maybe it's important to say everyone can participate in these raffles and there are no conditions. It's really just, you can win it by chance. Uh, we, have, we have no conditions. You don't even have to be German. You don't even have to be an adult. We even have child winners, like five or six. Um, and you could even register from Greece. Uh, the problem is we don't have a proper English translation at the moment, but it's possible. <laughs> and yes, so what's so special? What's so special about the idea and what makes it so successful? I think there are a couple of factors that are important to name here. So the first I already mentioned, um, everyone can participate, which makes it very real for people. And we ask everyone who registers for the raffle and our website this question, uh, what would you do if your income was taken care of? So um, as I mentioned in the beginning, we turned this very abstract idea of the basic income into a very real possibility for people. And sometimes at our raffles, we even have, we have journalists present, you know, who film for, for TV or who record us for the radio. And after the raffles, they will always tell us, oh my God, you know, I registered for the raffle and now I'm a little bit sad that I didn't win, which is crazy if you think about the chances. It's, it's not very likely that you will win. But everyone who registers, they have this very small and irrational hope that they will be able to receive this basic income. And of course, it makes people think, you know, what would I do? And it gets very, very real and, you know, graspable, this idea. Um, and it gets, it gets people hopeful. And I think it inspires people, uh, even if they don't win, to think about how they want to live their lives and how they want to contrib contribute to society and what they really want to do. Um, and then... Another important factor is that instead of speculating about what others would do, like the lazy people or whoever and the other people in society, it really keeps, it really keeps this, um, this whole topic personal and um, positive in this way. Um, and then, of course, we gain real insights about how basic income works. And we can talk about this at events like this. We go to a lot of conferences, panel discussions, um, and give a lot of interviews to various um, media. And another really, really important thing is that the very personal experiences of our winners are perfect for the media to use. So 
you know, instead of reporting on a scientific theory, they can tell you, oh, this is, this is Mark and he's received a basic income for a year and this is what he did with it. Um, I, I'm and, sorry to, to interrupt you. Uh, yeah. Could you actually give a real example of a yes. specific Mark so we can yeah. get a taste of this? Yeah, Mark uh, is one of our winners and he has a chronic disease, a Mobus Crohn. I don't know. It's like a, it's an infection uh, of the stomach and it's a psychosomatic disease. So if you have a lot of stress, it gets worse. So it was very difficult for him because in Germany you get social support. Of course, you get welfare if you have a condition like that, but you still have to deal with the whole bureaucracy. You always have to justify uh, why you need the money. You have a lot of rules about what you can do, how much you can work, how much money you get. Um, and it's actually, it has proven to, to um, improve his health condition. So since he's received the basic income, his, you know, his blood, um, his, his whole health condition has improved a lot because he, he had the freedom to really take care of himself without dealing with the whole bureaucracy. Um, there are a lot of self-employed um, people who receive the basic income, a lot of women too, and they've been inspired to really take on projects they wanted to take on for a long time. And I think it's because um, receiving this basic income really made them think, you know, this is a chance to really live my dream. So we have one self-employed um, woman, Katrin, she, she decided to finally write a book. Um, we have a lot of people who, who take up another um, um, education, who get another training to change careers, for example. Um, we have stories. One tell, child. Huh? Tell me something. Uh, how many of these people uh, just became lazy? <laughs> there are none. Uh, let, me, let me repeat that. That was none, right? No, none. Okay. Just... Uh, just uh, no, uh, uh, they're, they're asking. Uh, you said basically none of these people became lazy, no. but most, but most of these people either went into education or tried a new job or tried a new project, right? Yes. Uh, okay. Um, I just wanted it, to point it, that it didn't out. Opposite. It didn't. It didn't make them lazy. In the beginning, a lot of these people report to us that it puts a lot of pressure on them, actually, especially in the beginning, because they feel, oh, my God, I have this money now. You know, this was crowdfunded. This was paid for by other people. And I have to somehow prove that I'm worthy of this chance. I have to prove that I make something of, of myself. So what you're saying is that we actually had the opposite result rather than actually yes. people being lazy. They mm -hmm. wanted to, uh, they became empowered. They wanted to like make something of themselves. Exactly. I, have a, um, I have a question from, from the audience because like this is uh, starting to make people, I guess, uh, curious. Uh, yeah. So I just want to like uh, bring this uh, lady right here. Can you say your name? And, uh, yes. yourself? Hi, um, Angela. Um, I just wanted to know, um, obviously, I'm sure you are recording the socioeconomic groups of people who are actually participating in the raffle. Um, I'm imagining um, in the UK, where I'm from, um, that the, the lowest socioeconomic groups would not be participating in a, a raffle of that sort. I can't imagine them going online to do that. And therefore, you're, you know, you're saying the majority are not being lazy. The lesser educated, the lower socioeconomic groups, are they participating? And are you including what they would do in those circumstances? Um, they are participating. So mm. the range of people that participate is really, really broad. We have, we have old people, we have young people, we have academics, we have self-employed people, we have unemployed people, we have sick people, <laughs> we have children. That's great to hear, yeah. Um, yes. And there are a lot of people who really, who really, um, who are stuck in the welfare system at the moment, for example, which is, which is okay, but um, it's in the, like in the UK where you have sanctions, for example, we have another project with which we fight these uh, sanctions. And there are a lot of people, it, it actually breaks my heart from time to time because they really, they write us their stories, you know, and they write us really long emails and they're like, oh my God, your project 
gives me so much hope um, because there are people like you who really believe <laughs> that humans are good and um, they tell us, you know, how much, how much they hope to win so they can finally, I don't know, go on a vacation after years or get their driver's license after 40 years of not having one. So yeah. it's not really like an elite project. Um, yeah, it's really diverse and the winners are also really diverse. I could imagine that um, some sectors of, of society that I have worked with would need a lot of time to turn around that approach. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, like you, I believe humans are good and I think they, they would, but I think because of the way that uh, um, they have been uh, approached in the past by society, they would not yeah. they would be quite negative and take advantage at first. That's yeah. why I'm interested in that. There's a gentleman here just asking me to uh, extend and say, um, you're also taking into account a variety of educational levels, I assume. Yeah, I, I can give you one story of a guy. I'll, I'll let you. Okay. Yeah, there's another story of someone um, who, when he when he received the basic income, he he didn't um, he was in a withdrawal uh, process from alcohol, and um, he had a lot of issues with the job welfare system before you know he did a lot of like shitty jobs helping out now and then but didn't really have a proper career or anything um and he didn't have time to really get the orientation he needed because he was forced to do all these jobs he actually didn't want to do you know help help people move uh, and stuff like that and um during the year of basic income he didn't only get clean but he's he actually he said he wanted to become like a system administrator because he liked to work with computers and he really used the year to to he trained himself in that time to become an IT administrator and at the end of the year he found a job in that field and since then like he's worked in this field and had like a full time found a full time employment which um for which he didn't get the help before but this intrinsic motivation was enough, apparently, and the basic income, like to get him back on his feet. Yes, that's another question. Uh, if the basic income would go on perpetually to these people, or at some point it stops. Uh, but uh, part of the question already asked, which I wanted to put uh, emphasize, is what is the educational level of the people who uh, apply to participate? Is it the majority of people who have a high educational level, or do you see also people with low or no educational level? Um, as I said before, there's, it's, not, it's not only people with a high educational level, it's everyone really there's no there's no pattern i think it's even though it's not a it's really i have to say it's not a scientific experiment it's more of a campaign mm -hmm. but still um the socio demographic uh, features of the winners they're pretty diverse and and very very broad like regarding age gender profession and also educational level okay and the other question, will it go on forever, these people, or is there a time limit? And they get it for one year. One year? Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess the, the question... How, how much? How much? Uh, 1,000 euros per month. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, uh, Ah, okay, so there's a, there's a one question which uh, a, a gentleman just asked me, which uh, was how did you do the outreach campaign with respect to the beneficiaries of the basic income uh, in your program? Um, the, the, I, outreach, I'm not... the, the outreach campaign is basically uh, how, what did you do to find the people who wanted to get the basic income? <laughs> okay. Yeah, well... That's not so difficult because I think 
I mean, I don't like to call it that because to me it's not like that. But if you can win money with no strings attached, it's not that difficult to find people that apply for it. Uh, how about the other side? Uh, how did you find people to give the money? And what did you do yeah, to convince those people? That's a more interesting <laughs> question, I think. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's a crowdfunding, right? You have to have, like, a little bit of, of skill in that regard. And we have the founder of Mein Grundeinkommen. He has a very compelling story himself. I think that contributed a lot to inspiring people to support this project. Because he, uh, Michel Beaumayer, he was a uh, uh, founder of a startup. And after seven years, he, he, he was, you know, he was not inspired to work in that firm anymore. And he decided to stop. But the firm was really successful. They were able, you know, to keep paying him. Um, so he received a basic income for himself uh, for a while. And for him, that was a really interesting experience. And um, after, you know, he enjoyed that for a while, it really made him think like, okay, um, how, does this, how would this affect other people? And he wanted to find out. And I think uh, Mishael, he has like a couple of characteristics that make this a really good story uh, for the media, but also for the donors for this project. Because, you know, he's this self-made man. He's not, he doesn't depend on welfare and still like he's a um, you know he's an entrepreneur but he's still really convinced of this idea and then I think why people contribute to this um, project and by now we know we have 25,000 people who contribute um, on a monthly basis and they crowdfund more than three basic incomes per month and they also finance the whole organization's um, work we are by now a team of 20 people. So that's not, it's not a huge organization, but it's also not so small and we need some money to keep it running. What is the, what is their uh, rationale for like contributing? I mean, what do you yeah, have? Exactly. I think my theory is um, that a lot of people, they feel that something's really changing. And um, I think that a lot of people who feel the pressure that's put on them in this, you know, neoliberal uh, market system. And the, the story we're telling about basic income, you know, about unfolding the human potential, about the trust we have in people that really inspires them. And they want to be part of the story. They want to be part of creating a positive alternative. And most people, they don't give a lot of money. You know, we don't have big donors. I was, about, I, I was actually about to ask you that. Do you have any like yeah. really big donors? Uh, no, we're completely reliant on crowdfunding. And the average contribution per month is four euros. That's fascinating. So it's not really the rich people are contributing to the no. basic. No, people, no, no, no. Like everyday uh -huh. people. That's actually a <laughs> yeah. great piece of uh, data. Yeah. I have a question from uh, the person who actually inspired me to make this event happen. So this is Evita yeah. right here. <laughs> Hi. No, it's, it's not. No, no, no. Um, I, I actually have a broader question mm -hmm. for you because um, you are, you're coming last. Uh, one more person, oh, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's a broader question around the concept in general. Um, I'm wondering, we are talking a lot about the impact of basic income in work-life balance or entrepreneurship, continuous education to people that they receive it. But I'm trying to figure out what is the correlation to more painful issues like trafficking or prostitution or modern day slavery. Um, because most of the times we talk about experiments and uh, concepts in Europe. And we're not talking um, a lot about cases in the global south or like Eastern Europe, Southern Eastern Asia. So I don't know if you have an opinion around that, or what would be the impact of um, such principle, basic income concepts around these issues, issues. Yeah. So, I mean, you've probably also talked about the gift directly experiment they're starting in East Africa. 
and the experiments in India. So it's, I mean, it's not only a Western debate. We haven't, we haven't talked um, about yeah. that. And I think, so first of all, I want to say that uh, in a lot of debates about basic income, there are those people who, who really think if we have basic income, you know, everything will go to shit. Like we're doomed. Nobody will work anymore. It's too expensive. It will ruin us. It will be a catastrophe, like a, a real dystopia. And then often there's this other side of people who think, you know, with basic income, basic income is the solution to every problem we have. And once we have basic income, you know, climate change will stop and women will be liberated and um, uh, we won't have problems anymore. And I don't want to take either side. I think basic income is necessary um, because it gives people the security and the freedom they need um, to really live meaningful lives. But I also think that basic income is necessary because it can be a lever in the sense that it will free people from the, um, from, from the necessity to participate in the labor market and it will free people like us, you know, activists, um, to really do meaningful political and social work in these areas. So I think basic income will have uh, an indirect effect on, on, other, on other issue areas we see today. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, that's cool. Uh, okay, so do you, are there any other questions uh, in the audience? There's, there's one thing that I want to mention, which I was, uh, I told you I was going to mention it. Uh, we have here in the audience some people that are in uh, non-profits and uh, run them. And uh, I was wondering, basically, because I read in your website uh, and I told you that person too, uh, you told me that your organization would be willing to help people in other countries perhaps set up a similar um, affiliated, perhaps, um, uh, efforts. Can you uh, potentially talk to us a bit more about that? How can that uh, become a reality? Because... No, I, I think a lot of people in Greece might be willing to, to give this a shot, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, exactly. So what I wanted to say about that is uh, I think we need those scientific pilots, you know, that are initiated by governments or, or non-profits and universities. But we, we learned from this campaign is that it really drives the debate and involves the people who will vote in the end, you know, who will, who will get involved to get basic, make basic income a reality. And as long as we only talk about it scientifically and in elite circles, I don't think the debate will be as powerful as we can make it. And for us, even though we are focused on Germany, just, you know, simply for a lack of resources, we want to have an international debate and we want to support uh, people who want to uh, create similar campaigns and we're ready to help with that. And um, we talk to people, uh, we, we, we try to start this thing in the US, they crowdfunded their first basic income, but it didn't really work out so well. So what I want to say is don't underestimate that this this kind of project, even though the idea is very simple, it requires a very specific set of skills in the founding team. You know, you need to know about how to campaign, how to how to crowdfund, because crowdfunding requires a very specific style of um, authentic personal communication. You need to know how to involve um, the people in your campaign. You need to have really good project management skills and organizational like building skills. And most importantly, the thing we also underestimated and which, you know, which we have been struggling for a while now is you need the right IT infrastructure to manage a crowd like that. 350,000 people on a website, you know, regular raffles. Um, giving them the raffle numbers and everything. This really needs to be um, set up really well. So it's not something you can just start like that. Um, but if you think you have the right people or you think you can find the right people and, and it would be really cool to have someone with a cool story to tell, you know, related 
um, to this to this uh, topic, like uh, Michael's story with his own, you know, self-made entrepreneur <laughs> basic income story. Uh, we're really happy to talk to you. Uh, yeah. We would visit you or you could visit us in Berlin. We're really open to talk. And our goal is really to, to set up this kind of organization everywhere and to scale it in this way. We have no interest in, you know, owning in owning the idea. Uh, I actually know the, the founder of, uh, I think, the, the largest Greek crowdfunding uh, uh, platform. Uh, yeah. I know him personally, so perhaps I could... Uh, Talk to him and convince him to partner. That could be one thing. Um, yeah. Last uh, last question because I know that like uh, uh, Mr. Dragumis also wants to talk about his experiences. Uh, uh, I wonder, did you reach out to like uh, Indiegogo or Kickstarter for like uh, help on the technology side? Because uh, I can see them jumping in this opportunity just for marketing reasons. Uh, yeah. Did you try that? Um, no, we didn't because what our website is really it's really special because. Um, we have this community idea, you know, we have people when they register on our website, they, they ask what they want to do with the basic income, they give, they give the answers, we try to track their raffle numbers and we want to involve them more, more like a little social network. Mm. And we're close now to the relaunch uh, of the new version of the website, which will work better, hopefully, because at the moment it's really buggy. And it's really stressing us out, but we're we're confident that this will change in a month or two. Yeah. Well, perhaps the one thing you could do if you want to like uh, have this expand rapidly is to uh, kind of like white label it, uh, but you can put your name on it. So uh, perhaps with a click of a few buttons, like um, a, a, another hub in Greece or Spain yeah. or whatever, could like easily like locally adapt it and uh, yeah. run the same engine. That would yeah, be the most helpful. The goal. the goal is with the new website, like. This website we run now was um, was coded by by the founder in like a month, and she never expected it to grow this big. So this is why we're having these problems. But the new version of the website, we really plan to make it adaptable for others, so they don't have to go through the same struggle we did, and they can just you know reuse it, rebrand it, adjust it to the um, specific situation or their specific uh, focus and um, once it's once it's available, it will make things very very uh, much easier for everyone who wants to like copy yeah. my basic income. Yeah, that's definitely the goal. So, for everyone who's interested in setting that up, um, I would just suggest to contact me or uh, my colleague who's responsible for the internationalization, and mm -hmm. we will keep you updated about the the progress with the software and how we can work together and. Um, ideally, how to get together personally, because at some point, I think that's uh, really helpful. I, I, I can uh, probably uh, help you with that. Uh, I mean, one of the things that I, I think I sent you that by the email is that uh, I have organized this event as an ambassador of the Thousand Network, and the Thousand Network is a. Uh, it might be a good, like, you know, time to actually say what the Thousand Network is, because it is essentially uh, right now about a thousand two hundred uh, young people from all over the world trying to like change the world either by entrepreneurship. Or art, or uh, like you no know, activism. So, in some sense, like I think that they will be uh, really happy to help to make this um, like work uh, internationally. So, uh, we'll definitely keep in touch. Uh, I know it's ten thirty-six, and I've already kind of like uh, abused your time. But uh, um, if um, I'm on my couch, it's <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, I guess like if there's no other questions, uh, I, I should like to, there's one more question. Okay, so there's one more question. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, have uh, this gentleman here. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm with a, a web series called Surviving Capitalism, and first thing I would it's survivingcapitalism.com. I'd love to interview some of your people. Um, yeah. Be in Berlin from the 19th to the 23rd, if possible. Yeah. And then the other question I have is. I've done a lot of interviews where we ask people what they're going through and what they have to do to, to, to get by. And you hear a lot of stories about people doing three jobs, um, about relationships falling apart. I think that this is the positive side. And so I guess my question is, what are the surprises and findings that you, of what happens to people when they get money in their pockets? Besides like just following their dreams, what's the thing that surprised you guys the most? Um. I think 
One of the most interesting stories is um, a child winner, uh, Robin. He was, I think, he was seven or eight when he got the basic income. He's like from a non-academic. Uh, background, but the pe but the family has a lot of pressure because they they built a house and um, the women uh, the the mother she stayed at home to raise the children the man goes to work you know mm -hmm. and the mother she got to she got to manage the money for the son wow and what she tells us it, is that this changed the whole power dynamic within the family. Um, because she got very much like more confident um, towards her husband and um, more independent because she had like this own this own um, income um, and they I mean they really invested it in their family and in the hobbies for the kids you know to take off some pressure to go on a vacation and everything but I, I found that really interesting because it's subtle you know it's not the most obvious thing right. Um, but it also tells us a lot about basic income and basic income it, and especially in relation to capitalism, we think about that a lot, of course, and it's not that obvious in the campaign, but in our team, it's like the topic. <laughs> oh. um, basic income asks the, the power question, you know, it turns up side down the whole power dynamic within society, which makes it so appealing for us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, within families, towards your employer, of course, because it gives you the power to leave. It gives you the power to say no and to really do what you want to do. And I think for me, that's the most fascinating um, result um, of the experiment. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I'll get connected with this guy. Sure. <laughs> Well, uh, this was uh, great. Uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing like a real experiment uh, that's happening in the real world rather than just in the, in the textbooks. Um, thank you for sharing your time and your experience. Uh, I'm just going to give you like a round of applause from, the, from me and the audience. <laughs> Uh, so uh, now I'm going to basically hang it, hand it over to um, uh, Mr. Dragumis, who is going to give a little overview of Basic Income Greece and what they've done. And uh, one of his uh, chief complaints, if I'm not uh, mistaken, is... Uh, I will you will say that, exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay, so thank you. Uh, I know you're on your couch. You can stay and listen if you want to. Uh, it's up to you. But yeah, uh, I'm going to give it over to Mr. Dragumis right now. Okay? Okay. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I think I'm going to go, but I, I really hope... Like, I wish you the best of luck for the whole project in Greece. And um, I'm happy to hear from every one of you if you're interested in working with us. Sure. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Right. So, okay. that's, uh, this is you. Yeah. Ah, it's me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I recognize myself. Okay. Well, you can address the You can do it in uh, both English and Greek. It's up to the audience. I think there are some... Uh, People who don't speak Greek. That's true, that's true. So I'll, yeah. I'll, okay, so it's English. I'll do it in English. Um, everybody speaks English, right? Yeah. Well, before I start telling a little bit what we did in Greece, I'd like to say one word. The word is emancipation. That's the effect of uh, having a universal basic income, having some things, basic things covered. Uh, so, from what we have seen and from what we heard today and from all the experiments which have been done, people don't actually get lazy. It doesn't happen because... But they change jobs. <coughs> they leave a job which is unpleasant and choose another one. Or they can choose their boss or they have a better opportunity to choose the conditions under which they work. So that changes a lot of things, like uh, Mira said. It indirectly has many effects, which, of course, some of them may be predicted, some may, may be unpredictable. Like, I think, uh, being uh, uh, the salary of a street cleaner may have to rise because fewer people will want to do that job. Um, so uh, in uh, Greece, 2013, we 
started as a small team uh, to take part in the citizen initiative, citizens initiative uh, to gather signatures throughout Europe to get the basic income discussed with the European uh, Parliament. Uh, that was the point at which we gathered. We were a team of three, four, five, six uh, people and we worked for about uh, two years. Now we have really dispersed. And <clears throat> I'll tell you a bit about what the limitations to our work in uh, Greece was. Uh, one thing was that uh, in order to sign, the, the, to give your signature for the Citizens Initiative uh, campaign, you had to give your uh, ID number. So many people thought that, oh, this is, what's this? I don't really want to get. So that was a limiting factor, I think, to, to getting many signatures. Because, on the other hand, you would think that uh, Greece, uh, country in crisis, and uh, with such an idea, people would go, "Oh, wow, this is a very good idea. Let's go for it." But it wasn't that way. Uh, Greece is a very divided uh, in ideological camps. There is the right wing with. Uh, let's say the traditional conservatives and the neoliberal part of it, and on the other hand, the left wing. On, on the right, people would just say, "Well, giving money to people who, which is not related to work, is a very bad idea. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to hear about it." So it was very difficult to get into, with a few exceptions, into that. Uh, on the other hand, on the from the left, you could hear things like, what, you give money to rich people? That, that's, what are you talking about? I mean, this is, uh, why? This is crazy, you have, you have to have conditions. How can you give money to the, the guy who has 10 villas and 50 hotels? Well, you try to explain, but the, the point is that it's unconditional, it's exactly uh, the point. It's again, it has to be equal to everybody, but it's very difficult to get this uh, message to people who have, have been used to the kind of ideology of uh, the left. Uh, but in fact, the, the strong point for me of uh, universal basic income, which is that it's an idea that's either right wing or left, became here the weak point, because nobody likes something which is, let's say, neutral. Um, and we had extreme points of view, like, well, what we want to do is to overthrow capitalism. You'll be giving this bad capitalist money to, to, to people, and therefore you will preserve this bad system. So we had many difficulties. Well, there were some people who were inspired by it, but we had difficulties in getting the message through to large groups of people who have been used to thinking in a very, very different way. Uh, well, in theory, we still are a group in, in Greece, but we had we haven't been. Uh, we had some, you know, everybody has a job, uh, other things to do. So right now, we haven't been doing very much. But it would be good to have this thing started uh, again. Now that uh, you took uh, this initiative, and do more because, as we heard, it may be not the panacea, it may be not a solution for everything, but it's necessary. That's what I have to say. So, any questions, any ideas, are welcome. I have a question. Yeah. Anyone have one? I have one. Uh, I'm wondering basically uh, what were some of the uh, some of the good in our generations that were accepted by most of uh, the public that you spoke to? Because you talked about all the, yeah, yeah. all the negative ones, but yes. where did you get the most traction? Which reasons brought most of the Greek public? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to, to think about them. Okay, but uh, I'm a bit of a pessimist. But um, uh, it did inspire some people. We did get a good number of uh, people to sign, and I think it was a few thousand people. But uh, uh, it was some people would just think, oh, this is 
too good to be true. It, uh, it's a very good idea, but it will never happen. You know, it's, you're talking about an ideal society or something that would never happen. Uh, we did get some enthusiasm from people. Was it from like specific uh, educational background or uh, was it from the class or was it all over? Well, I think that uh, having a high educational background uh, played a huge role for people to understand the concept of why it has to be unconditional and then to understand that this changes things. It's, uh, that work is not only what you do in the office or what you do in the factory, it's also what you do at home, washing the dishes. It's, you have to change the way you view your everyday life. So for people to make the shift, it's, they have already to have worked somehow on the idea or thought about it. So uh, people of a lower educational level, I don't think it's easy to for them to have an immediate understanding. Maybe you have some experience yes, from uh, 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 Christos had an, had an experience in Caterini and uh, yeah, uh, was also part of the team. So uh, I ran a few Facebook campaigns and mainly I ran the video, there was a small spot, video spot uh, like was like three minutes, I think, and it had uh, it ran very well. It had very good reception uh, across age groups and across uh, political affiliations. I think, uh, of course, the campaign was targeted within Greece and English-speaking people because it was uh, mainly my, the page I used was uh, was English English speakers. But, uh, the, of course, all the, all the positive uh, acceptance of the campaign did not necessarily translate into signatures or more members in the team. But uh, on Facebook, it was very well received, the, the video and the whole idea. Uh, yes, uh, having learned the second language is already your question. Yes, um, Could, would you mind coming over to the I can give you a mic. No, but it won't, it won't go through the. Sorry about that because uh, the only talk online. Sure. Um, well. I got a, a couple parts to this. Uh, in my city back in New York, it's called Beacon, New York. Uh, I created a project called the Beacon Experiment. And what we did, the Beacon mm -hmm. Experiment, it's a it's Facebook page. It has a great museum of art. In a exactly, in outdoors, mountains, and everything, if you want to come on vacation. Okay, <laughs> not really. Um, but we did something with Facebook groups. And uh, the, the point being, this might be something that we can share with you and with other people around the planet, is that we got 60% of our city using Facebook groups in what I would call hyper-local disintermediation. That's where we cut out the middlemen that we normally have to pay to market to. So Facebook wants you know, $10 for 4,000 views of an ad or a video campaign. And of that uh, 4,000 views, you'll probably get 600 people watching for three seconds. So they're not even really consuming the content. And so the way that we could reach people was by creating Facebook groups. And the way that we create Facebook groups that people come into them is we use um, kind of guerrilla marketing, search engine optimization. So what would somebody type in each city to, to find something very specific? Well, in Beacon, we did buy, sell, trade. We did uh, Beacon Works, which is hyper-local jobs listings. We did tool exchanges. Um, we did Beacon Votes, which the, the long tail of the project, I think somebody said about 30 years, uh, we're trying to create a direct democracy. And by using people's habit of social media, which they're on, we can then slowly train them to become more civically involved with real identity. And so I'm sharing that with you because I think that it's really important that everyone out there understand that it takes time. And if you go on Facebook, which everyone is, it's the largest part of the global population, we can actually hijack a behavior um, and get it out there. And then the other part I wanted to, to just suggest is when I keep listening to people talk about basic income and, and people are like, what, what is this? And why, why does this, why would I do this? It's because somebody else is controlling what we would call the narrative of 
what work is. And I think the easiest argument to getting rid of even fighting people over uh, the right for basic income is redefining what the word work is. And that's it. And, it's, and, and then we don't even have to fight with them. And it's like straightforward, this is, this is a new way of thinking. Maybe that's a good starting point. Instead yeah. talking about basic income, we should start talking about what is work. Exactly. Yeah. And then maybe, you don't have to fight. Maybe it's, uh, yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. We, we did use Facebook in our campaign uh, and Facebook groups. But as uh, you said, it did not translate into signatures because we're trying to... to yeah, so events, then you do so, Facebook events. And you, you actually call people to actually... In and we, we did physical events too in mm -hmm. uh, various places. And, uh, but uh, I think that the point with signatures is that people are suspicious of giving their ID. That was... I heard that many times. That why would I give my... I don't want to... Okay, I sign, but I don't want to give my... ID number to, the, to those obscure people who are up in Brussels. But if you had offered them uh, basic income, like money, they would probably like. <laughs> we couldn't. We couldn't <laughs> offer uh, basic income. Well, uh, any other questions? Okay, fine. Thank you. And I think. This can is I? Good. Sorry. Can sorry. Hold on, Fida. Warm things up again. Let's see how we can do it. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Well, um, for whoever is watching, uh, this uh, concludes our uh, event. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for joining. Uh, this um, event is also going to be available online later for viewing, in case you want to like, review some of the points, because it's not only live streaming, but it keeps a record of it. So whoever basically wants uh, a record of it, I can just go to the same address and I'll post it on the event page and can come to you later or share it. So. Um, Thanks. I'm going to stop the broadcast right now. Uh, also, uh, before I forget, I want to thank uh, Stavros Messinis of the Cube for uh, generously providing the space. Uh, and uh, for uh, Evita for inspiring uh, with uh, her suggestion of doing this uh, as the first, basically, talk. Uh, as I said, like this is part of a, um, and this event was organized uh, because I'm an ambassador for a uh, thousand network. Um, the Thousand Network is a, is a group of um, extraordinary people around the world who try to uh, change, it, change it in meaningful ways. Uh, it doesn't matter where you're from, it doesn't matter like what you believe in, what's your sexual orientation, what's your race, uh, and you can still join and uh, try to change the world with us. So whoever's, whoever's interested like, to learn more about it can like, uh, uh, catch me later after the podcast. So that's pretty much it. I'm going to stop the progress right now. Thank you all for watching if you're there online. Um, so that's pretty much it. Bye.